Bom dia a todos. I would like to introduce Dr. Eduardo Valle. It's a pleasure receive him here. Eduardo Valle is a professor at the Depart Department of Computer Engineering and Industrial Automation, DCA, of FEC at State University of Campinas, Unicamp. He uh, was also a faculty member. Was or is? Yes. He is also a faculty member of the Recode Lab. Reason for complex data. He got a PhD in computer sciences at the University of Sergi Pontoise in 2008. He got a master in Bachelor in Computer Science at Federal University of Minas Gerais in 2003 and 2001, respectively. He works with a talented team of researchers and students on smart servers for education and health and large-scale machine learning. So it's a pleasure to receive you here. Okay, and I would like to introduce also Dr. Mathieu Cord. He was uh, Edouard Valle advisor in France. Okay, Mathieu Cord is a full professor at Computer Science Department, LIPS 6, at UBC, Sorbonne University, Paris, France. In 2009, he was nominated at the RUF French, French Research Institute for a five-year delegation position. I lost it. Uh, he's currently CNRS Scientific Advisor for INS21. His research interests include computer vision, pattern recognition, machine learning. Thank you so much for coming. It's a very pleasure to see you here. The battery is off. Tem um bom evento. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roseli. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. Uh, so, let's talk about deep learning. Everyone else is talking about it, so let us, too, talk about it. Uh, this is our outline for today. Let's talk a little bit about the hype, the hype about deep learning. Let's then have a technical primer, the hard stuff. Then we'll talk about some selected topics, selected applications, and I'll finish about some uh, ethical concerns that people have about this technology. So, uh, let's start with the hype. The hype about deep learning. It's on everyone's minds nowadays. <coughs> Those are all recent, or fairly recent, titles of the New York Times. Uh, this one is very interesting. Artificial intelligence software is booming, but why now? And uh, this is true. Uh, artificial intelligence is the new deer of both big and small industries around the globe. And we have some, break, some important breakthroughs uh, this year and last year. This is one of the most visible when uh, AlphaGo won the, the game of Go from the, the grandmaster in the game. Uh, the game of Go has a complexity, has a uh, game complexity, algorithmic complexity that is much larger, uh, <coughs> uh, tens of hundreds of, of uh, more complex than the game of chess. So for a long time, this game was considered one of the last bastions of human intelligence. So for a machine to, to win this game, it was 
really, really an important uh, benchmark. Uh, and the, something that I find interesting is not only that the big, the big industries are the big five, uh, uh, Facebook, Microsoft, Google, um, IBM, and which one's the fifth? fifth? Apple, maybe, <laughs> are running, uh, are trying to, to do machine learning. But I find it even more interesting uh, that reveals what, what we are going through right now is that small startups, uh, hundreds, thousands of small startups are also attempting artificial intelligence. And this is true not even for the Silicon Valley, but it's also true for Brazil in what I call Campinas Valley. <laughs> in the Campinas Valley, we, we see this, this huge amount of startups that contact the, us professors and they are trying to, to come with new business plans for exploiting uh, artificial intelligence. And the question is interesting to ask, why now? Why are those things booming right now? And the answer is that we are living a confluence of several factors where, of course, we have the right hardware, the right hardware uh, in the form of massive parallel machines which are cheap, which are affordable, uh, the GPUs, uh, which started as graphical devices, have been hijacked to do now general processing, in which is called the GPGPU, general processing on GPUs, and those massively parallel architectures are almost mandatory to do deep learning. Uh, then we have, uh, on the other hand, uh, massive uh, data sources which are needed to train the models. So we, we have both uh, the data and the computational power to train the models. Uh, of course, so one thing that has been very important to make those models more popular is uh, a software infrastructure that makes uh, using those, those GPUs easier. Uh, I don't know how many of you have tried to do low-level GPU programming. Maybe someone who used low-level CUDA, etc. It's nightmarish. No one deserves that. <laughs> and uh, uh, when some libraries like, for example, Teano, uh, etc., arrive to, that allow to do high-level uh, numerical computation on GPUs. This was a huge factor to make those things more popular. And of course, uh, and the importance of this uh, cannot be overstated. We have found architectures that actually converge. Uh, of course, people say, okay, deep learning is nothing new. The idea of putting several layers was here since the 80s. The problem is that the architectures proposed on the 80s, they didn't converge. And the architectures proposed today do. This is not a small difference. And uh, there is a lot of craftsmanship, it's very delicate and complex craftsmanship to make the networks converge. And nowadays, after 30 years, we do have this craftsmanship. Uh, something that really marked for me this changing point, this definitive changing point in popularity of those methods was last year's SNPs. Last year's SNPs, the conference sold out. Uh, you couldn't go to the conference if you wanted, because all tickets had sold out. Uh, last year, SNPs, the, uh, the conference used to be a few thousand people, a thousand or two thousand people, and last year's conference was 6,000 people. 6, people. Uh, it was like Comic Con. <laughs> it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. Uh, and, and this, for me, marks also uh, the, the phase change that we have in this moment of uh, uh, machine learning. 
So let's talk about how how this is does, how this history came to be. Uh, in the community, in the academic community, uh, neural networks or convolutional ne networks mm, exist for a long time. We talk about the winters of uh, neural networks, which are moments where the field was less popular. But even during this, those winters, the field didn't disappear. There were uh, researchers who, who were working on the subject. But uh, during most of the 90s and the, the 2000 years, uh, People were investing and in studying more statistical, purely statistical methods like SVM. And the definitive moment where the community, at least the computer vision community, started to seriously, seriously paying attention to neural networks was when the first convolutional network won the ImageNet competition. The ImageNet competition uh, is a, a competition on this data set. ImageNet is a data set. It's a data set with uh, literally millions of images. Uh, nowadays, it must have 20 or 30 million of images. The images are labeled with the categories of WordNet, which is a thesaurus. It's a hierarchical thesaurus. Uh, and uh, the competition is based on a subset, on a subset of this image net, a particularly nice and clean uh, subset of, of uh, image net that has a thousand, uh, thousand of categories and about to 1 million, 1.2 million of images. And the idea is to take one, take one picture, the basic uh, vanilla test on image net, you take one picture and you have to say what is the main category of this picture among 1,000. Uh, I must say that the categories, because they are the leaves on the WordNet tree, they are fairly specific. You have to make the difference between, for example, uh, Siberian Husky and uh, Alaskan Dog. For me, they are absolutely the same. <laughs> But you have to make the difference between those categories. Um, because, uh, be because sometimes more than one category may be represented in the image, and because of uh, computation noise, you can give five uh, attempts. You can, you can attempt five uh, choices. And if one of your choices is right, uh, it's considered correct. So normally, the main statistics is the top five uh, accuracy. On this statistic, on this data set. So usually you have uh, uh, one million images to train and uh, one one thousand, one fifty thousand images to test. And this is the history of ImageNet. Uh, in the year two thousand twelve, uh, those were the classic statistical uh, learning techniques based on very advanced bag of words techniques. Uh, and the state of the art, art at the time was around 30% uh, uh, error rate. Uh, this, this was already a victory. Getting the error as low as 30% was, the, 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 the errors didn't start at 30%. So the, the competition, I think, started at 2010. And, and this this, those were good results. The, the community had, had uh, already learned a lot with, with the fast. But the interesting novelty in 2012 was this. Was this. The first uh, deep learning technique had a 10% margin of improvement in comparison with the best bag of words. And this, this was shocking because usually uh, the best techniques, they are very, very close together. In this kind of competitions, people are normally fighting for tenths, uh, tenths 
of percent. The best technique will be, I don't know, uh, 21, and the second best will be 20.6, and the margin of victory is 0.4%. And then you have the champion, that is more than 10% better. And then people were, whoa, what's happening here? And the next year, everyone was doing deep learning. Everyone was doing deep learning. And a few years later, I'm sorry to state that bag of words are dead. <laughs> They're dead. Uh, so, uh, of course, it's interesting to talk about this. This is a classification uh, task, and deep learning has dominated classification tasks in images. Image classification has been dominated by deep learning then. But it's interesting also to see deep learning in other tasks than classification. Deep, le deep learning models who do, which do stuff. Uh, the aforementioned uh, uh, AlphaGo, which is a very complex model, AlphaGo. AlphaGo it's not a purely deep learning model. Uh, the novelty here is that you have, as always, uh, always when you do gamey decision stuff, you have this kind of tree of decision, and uh, AlphaGo has deep learning to decide the valuation of the trees, and uh, it was a huge success. And for other games, especially video games, you also have uh, here, here you, you have those, um, I forgot the name, sorry, when you do reinforcement learning, exactly. When you do reinforcement learning here, you have deep learning, which were embedded in reinforcement, in reinforcement learning uh, techniques and uh, to, to, to play Atari games, to play Atari games. And interesting, in, and the, the same model, the exactly the same model could be trained to play dozens of games, and on the majority of those games, uh, the performance was above human uh, competence. So uh, I, I find those, those models very interesting because they are not models just for classification. They are models which do or even uh, create stuff. For example, this is a generative model and there is a whole uh, area of research for generative model where you train the model with the Shakespeare uh, corpus of works, and then you can sample, you can sample new Shakespeare. It's not uh, very convincing as uh, poetry or especially semantics go, but what's interesting in this model is that it actually, if you look it very far away, and if you are fairly drunk, it, it looks like Shakespeare. It looks like a, it, for, it has the right format, and the names of the characters are convincing, and it has the right number of verses, etc. And those models are sampled character by character. And this is for me, it's, which is impressive. You just ask the model, give me the next character, give me the next character, give me the next character. And the model has a long-term memory enough to generate uh, character names and uh, new lines, etc., etc. Uh, even more impressive than, than, than this is how those same models, those same text generative models, uh, learn uh, internal algebraic representations or geometric representations which make sense. And uh, if you project your words into this internal vector representations, uh, for example, th there is this model which is called word-to-vec that converts words into vectors. Those vectors kind of make sense. And you have things like uh, uh, I don't know, Paris minus France plus England is London. Or King minus man plus woman is Queen. And those things which are very impressive. So the, the internal representations make sense. And then you have this famous uh, deep art 
things where you can you can apply the networks. And, and if you do if, if, with that with ImageNet, there will always be dogs somewhere because among the thousand classes of uh, uh, the ImageNet competition, I don't know, one third is different dog breeds. But you, you can sample images directly from your dreams or nightmares. Uh, and you can even do what you call style transfer. Because it's the same way, for example, that word to vec linearizes semantics. You can have models which linearizes uh, aspects of images, putting contents and style in different uh, independent components of your internal representation. So you can take uh, the content dimensions of this image and the style dimensions of this image. And uh, when I say plus here, is almost liter literally, almost liter literally, you can linearly combine those uh, things to, to get uh, an intermediate image uh, that makes sense. So, I'm showing all this because, of course, of course there is a hype going on. Of course there is a bubble effect going on. And we can say that maybe the expectations, especially when you talk about the popular press, uh, and the, maybe the naivety of the journalists. We have to be careful about that. People are putting just too much expectation on deep learning. Okay, so let's everyone sober up. Uh, and deep learning is not going to solve all the mankind's problem, and probably deep learning will not become Skynet. <laughs> but, <laughs> At the same time that I want everyone to sober up and have realistic expectations about what deep learning is about, I also want to remark that from a technical and scientific point of view, uh, deep learning is a revolution. It is allowing us to make things that we couldn't dream about doing even uh, 10 years ago. So we, we have to, to at once uh, be attentive to not overstate what it can do, but not to dismiss it as just uh, non-consequential. So let's talk about the technical part. I think that to have a, a better understanding about what deep learning can do and what it can't do we have to have a better technical understanding of, of the technique. And I'll start with a certain pain, like my, my former advisor and colleague say. I'll start with the biological metaphor. Emphasis on metaphor. So this is the drawing of a neuron. So this is the drawing of a neuron. And the neuron is what we have in our brains. There is no robot in the, in the audience. And I hope I'm not being, not committing some biological bigotry, assuming that all of us have neurons on our brains. And the, a neuron is a computational machine. A neuron is a computational uh, artifact that works very in a way, in a way very simply, in a way very simply, it has this cell body and those uh, extensions which are called dendrites, uh, from the Greek origin that means simply tree, so it has these trees, and those trees receive information, they get information in the form of electrical or chemical messages from elsewhere, normally other neurons, usually other neurons, and then uh, this, this, those messages, the chemical electrical messages, they are computed, some of them stimulate the neuron, some of them calm down the neuron, 
And then this kind of complex message uh, reaches one decision. The, the neuron takes one decision whether or not it will transmit this message through this long part, which is called the axon. So it takes several messages from the dendrites, makes some computation to decide that will I transmit the message or won't I transmit the message, and then it. If it, if it decides to transmit the message, the message goes through the axon and reach those extensions where it can excite other neurons. Uh, usually, it can, or other neurons or muscles, etc. And the circuit works quite like that. This is usually the, the neuron circuitry. As you have. Uh, uh, some neurons that are connected to the dendrites of other neurons, and the, each neuron decides whether or not the message goes through uh, in this way, always from dendrites uh, towards the axon. And because of that, we can. That there was this idea that we could simulate in a very, very simplified way we could simulate artificial neurons. And this is the connect, uh, connectivist view of what a neural network is. You have the inputs. Each input is connected to those internal neuron layers. And uh, then you have the output here. And you, you take the output here. And the, the idea is, is that uh, for example, if I take a particular neuron, we could see these incoming connections as the dendrites that get the input, and then this cell body that computes some function and draws the output to the next layer. Uh, we could see the, the, those outcoming connections as the axon. We, we, we could really see that. And on the original model, which was called uh, perceptron, uh, this metaphor was even more clear because uh, what, what you did is, is that you computed the sum, uh, the weighted sum of the incoming messages, and then you have this kind of step function. You had this, this step function where you literally decide whether you your output would be zero or one. So there was that axon-like decision. Uh, am I going to transmit something or nothing to, to the next layer? So this is the, this, this is the, the, the basic scheme of the artificial neuron with, with this. The, 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 the connectionist metaphor is present and uh, According to, to your choice of how you compute the weights and which activation function you choose, it can be more or less biologically plausible. Just for uh, us, and say that it's fully connected. Oh, yes, yes. This, this, is, this, is, this, this is scheme that I'm showing here. It has this characteristic that from... It has two important characteristics. The first is that it's what you call feed-forward. Notice that each layer connects with the next layer and with nothing else. In particular, there is no feedback. This is an important thing. Um, the second thing is that each layer is fully connected with the next layer. So you can see that each neuron connects with every other neuron in the next layer. So those are often called fully connected layers, and this kind of network is often called a feed-forward uh, network. Uh, I want to, just to show you that this is a culture of rat uh, cortex cells. Just to dismiss a little bit this naive idea that our fully connected feed-forward networks really model correctly what uh, biological neurons do. The neurological neurons, uh, biological neurons are a mess. They are really a mess. Uh, 
to start with, they are not feed forward. They have feedback everywhere. Uh, timing, the dynamic aspects of those neurons is extremely important. So more important if on whether or not I will transmit the information. When the timing of the information is extremely important for uh, biological neurons, uh, the number of connections, even locally, is flabbergasting. The neurons will have thousands of local connections. So biology is a mess. It's a mess. Uh, which, and so th that's why I want, uh, I I'm not really necessarily on a crusade against the biological interpretation. I find that the biological inspiration is fruitful. It, it, it is. It's very fruitful. But I don't want, uh, on the other hand, that you became like chained or slaves to this kind of biologic, <coughs> biologic tyranny. So use the biological inspirations, but don't become slaves to, to the biologic view. So for the remainder of my, of my talk, Okay, let's just forget about this. <laughs> okay. So for, for, the, for the remainder of the course, uh, this, this is how we will approach uh, deep uh, neural networks. Let's take the, the neural out of, of the deep networks. And we will approach uh, those things from a statistical viewpoint. We'll take a statistical viewpoint. And the statistical viewpoint is that we have, uh, uh, we have data, or we have observations, or we have a model. Let's, let's talk about the model. We have a model. We have a model. Uh, and the, in this model, we'll, we assume sometimes that uh, we know how the data is generated. In this model, for example, I'm, I'm assuming that I know how the data is generated. I'm assuming that I have two variables here, that I have uh, this x variable that can be, for example, I don't know, uh, I don't know how my, my, my height, or, and the, the, the y variable that can be my weight, <coughs> what do I know? Anything that, the, that can be linearly, approximately linearly related. <coughs> And I'm assuming that there is a linear uh, relationship between those variables, but uh, the relationship is not perfect. I'm assuming that there is some noise or there is a source of unknown variation uh, between this relationship and that this source of the variation is Gaussian. And the, those are all assumptions that compose my model of how the data is generated. Uh, and the problem here is that I'd like to know more about the relationship of those things, but I don't know W, I don't know B, and I don't know sigma. And I'd like to estimate all those things. And I, I like, I'd like to move from what's happening here uh, to what's happening here where I have some idea, some estimation of what W is, some estimation of what B is, and that allows me, when I observe some value for X, I can estimate some value for Y. And, and that's what a model is. Uh, when, when you talk about a statistical model or prediction model, this is what we're talking about. Uh, a model is a very concrete Thing. It's not just some crazy, imprecise abstraction. A, a, a model, model is something that puts money in your pocket. And uh, we will talk, in, in this talk, we will talk mostly about uh, supervised <coughs> learning models. When we are in supervised learning, uh, in, in a supervised learning context, we suppose a certain relationship between an input uh, quantity, an uh, input data, and some output quantity. So, in the previous uh, drawing, I was in what is called a regression model. I had some numerical input and some numerical output, 
and I suppose both continues, and I suppose there is a, a continuous relationship between both, and this, this is usually called the regression model, and uh, in this drawing, I have uh, uh, some uh, image as input, my input data is an image, it's not a single number anymore, and my output is not a number anymore, my output is one of ten, one of out of ten classes, one out of ten labels, it's a categorical output, and those models are usually called classification <coughs> models, but both are supervised uh, learning contexts, in which what I'm actually trying to find is this. I'm trying to find the relationship between those variables. Uh, often, often, I will assume that this function between those, those variables can be reduced uh, by a parametric relationship, and what I have to find is an estimation to the unknown parameter. And once I find this relationship, once this relationship is found, I can do stuff. I can do profitable or interesting stuff. For example, here, after I used my training set, what is called the training set, and the training set is the set in which I know both the images and the labels. I have a, a certain number of images in which the label is uh, known, in which the label is available. And then I can use my estimated model to annotate new images. So when I find the images without the labels, I can use the learned model to estimate or to find the label. And now some can be right and some can be wrong. And I can evaluate if, uh, if, if I have a, another way to find the, the, these labels, for example, using human annotators, I can evaluate, and during this test phase, I can evaluate uh, what my, how my model was going. Okay? Questions so far? Really? Because now, we, it, this was the easy part. We are now going... <coughs> We're now going to enter the, what I call, I don't know how to translate that in English, but now, uh, now we're going to enter the tobogan mathematical. <laughs> and and th this was really the easy part. Uh, so really, no questions, are you sure? So if you're sure, let's talk about uh, the estimation of those models. Let's talk, as I told, the aim here is use the data we have to find this model, usually estimating some parameters, uh, and let's talk a little about how this process uh, can arise. Uh, so this is the, uh, our interlude, let's talk about what they call the dangers of maximum likelihood. Uh, here I will use a running example, this example is really, really famous. This comes from a, a book from Bishop, Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning. Uh, this, this book is a really good primer if you, if you want to, to go through uh, this kind of broad treatment of machine learning and see regression, classification, neural, neural networks, kernel methods, uh, PCA, everything, and the kitchen sink. Uh, it's, it's a book thick like that, but it gives a nice primer about everything. And this is a very famous example in, in the book, uh, in which we are trying to do regression. This is a regression case. I have two variables, two, co two continuous numerical variables here, x and y, uh, and I'm trying to find the relationship between the two. Uh, here it's interesting. I assume there is a continuous, uh, continuous relationship between the variables. And uh, Unknown to me, I don't know that. This is very important to be aware. I don't know that. But the true relationship is that uh, y is the sinus of x plus some noise, plus some source of, of uh, unexplained vari variability. 
Uh, and that this is the true process that creates the data. But again, I don't know that. Someone created the data set and didn't tell me that. It's very important to realize that because otherwise what the other things don't, just don't make sense. It doesn't make sense to, to do the, the estimation procedure if I assume that I know the process. If I assume that I know the process, I can use the process directly. I don't have to do the estimation. So remember, I don't know the green curve. I just know the blue points. The only thing that I have access to is a sample, a sample from the process. And because I don't know the true process, I have to decide on a model to estimate this true process. And here, a good model, a model that is reasonable to assume, is that the, the data is generated by some polynomial. Because if I choose a polynomial of ha, ha, order higher enough, I can approximate anything. If, if I choose a, a polynomial of order 1,000, uh, if, if, my, if my function is not one of those crazy uh, Cantor functions, I, I will be able to approximate it. Uh, so, I decide on a model to estimate, to estimate the relationship between the variables. And then what I, I have to do is to find the parameters of the model. Okay? And that's what we're going to do. The thing here, and this is the gray box that's interesting. I, if I have a extra information, if I have extra information, I may assume that uh, the relationship between the two variables is given by a deterministic part, this part that I don't know about, but I assume that it's determinist, and, the, and there is an explainable, a non-explained noise. And I may assume that this noise is Gaussian, that this noise is Gaussian uh, with uh, uh, zero mean and an unknown but fixed uh, uh, deviation. Uh, and if I assume that, I win some properties. There are some, pro some extra properties arise if I assume that the noise is Gaussian. So this is important. So uh, the model may be just this, or the model may be both of this. If I decide to make the extra assumption, if I have extra information, or if, uh, even if I don't have extra information, if I have a reason to, to, to just decide that the, model is, that the noise is Gaussian, uh, my model became those two things. I'm assuming a certain parametric form for the estimation, and I'm assuming that the, the, that the noise is Gaussian. Uh, another thing that we will do for the remainder of, the, of this work is that we will have to give up this kind of notation. Uh, this kind of notation is good for high school and it's good when you have this kind of uh, three parameters. You have three parameters, we can't afford to write things like that. In the plan you will have about uh, a thousand million parameters and you can see that we won't have enough paper or screen space to write the a thousand million, a uh, hundred million parameters. So we will have, we, we have to get used to write things in matrix notation. This is mandatory. We have to get used to writing in matrix notation. So th here, this and that, I didn't change anything. The model really didn't change anything. The only thing I did is to move from scalar notation to matrix notation. And here there is a, a, a small clever trick that everyone uses that, so get, get used to that because everyone uses that. Uh, the, the bias parameter, which is the, the free parameter that doesn't multiply anything, the, this W0 here that doesn't come with an X, I will put it in, in the same vector as the other parameters, and I put a little one here. And this, I, I, people will always do that. So this is something that you, you have to, to expect. 
And the problem here, uh, the thing that I have to, to, to toss to the side is on the model complexity. I have to decide which end do I want to use. Here I chose three. I, I put a three as the model complexity, but I could have chosen one, two, or a hundred. And this is not without consequence. Uh, this choice is not without a consequence. And let's play a little bit with this. Let's play a little bit with this. The discussion that uh, follows. So, this is exactly the same model. Uh, there is a true <coughs> distribution for the data, but uh, I don't know this, this distribution. The true process is unknown. The, the only thing that I have access to is the blue dots. And I have uh, to estimate a model, which here it's shown in this orange line. I have to estimate a model, uh, which I expect will allow me to, for example, to explain the data I have and to predict new data. So uh, in the supervised learning, uh, in, this, in the statistical world, Sometimes the first, uh, the first, uh, tab, the first uh, job is, is important. It's the most important. I want to just to explain the data that I have. Explain to me the data that I have. But in the machine learning, the second task is the most important. Uh, I, I'm not very. I, I don't care that much about the explanation. I just want to to predict new data for me with high accuracy. But here we're trying to do both. And uh, the thing that I have to decide, because uh, th this model here is exactly the model that I showed you, uh, the, the, the hyperparameter that I have to decide is the complexity of the model. So here I put m equal to zero. So I just, the only thing that I can decide is this bias, <coughs> is this bias parameter that decides how high I, I put my, my, my line. And so uh, the best parameter for here is just to put the average of the dots. It's a very rigid, the model is not very good, uh, the model doesn't explain the data very much, but there is one reasonable choice for this parameter, which is just the average of the blue dots. So here there's, there are already several phenomena going on. There are already several phenomena going on that I want to explain to you. The first one is that the model is too rigid and it doesn't explain the data. When that happens, we say in the machine learning community, community that the model underfits. So remember that term to, just to, to, to draw it out in a cocktail party. <laughs> the names are not very important. The concepts are more important. But some names you will find uh, in the blogs, etc. So this is a model that underfits. It doesn't adapt to the data enough. So even with the data that I have, I, I don't. I don't even have to. I don't even have to to see new data to to see that, that this model is not good. Even with the data that I already have, I can see that this model is garbage. It underfits. The other thing is that even for this horrible model, I cannot choose the weights arbitrarily. There is one value for the bias weight that is best, better than all the others. And the best choice here for a given set of assumptions is the average of all the blue dots. If I assume, if I make that assumption that I made earlier, that the noise is Gaussian, the only choice that makes sense here is to take the average of the points. The average of the points under the assumption that the noise is Gaussian is the choice that makes this data the most believable point possible. It's the choice that makes the most plausible that this model actually generates the data. So in statistical parlance, 
it's the choice of maximum likelihood. Maximum likelihood. It's the model that makes the data most likely. I like the Portuguese name uh, better. Uh, maximum, máxima verosimilhança. Uh, in, in French it's the same. Uh, vraisemblance. And uh, vraisemblance or verosimilhança, verosimili. It looks like true. So I'm choosing that, I'm choosing the parameters that makes the data look like true. It makes the data look like true. Uh, okay, let's pick up some, some better adjusted model. If I pick two parameters, now I can have both the bias and the inclination, and this again is the is the the model that look that makes the data more likely. It's not very good, but it makes the data more likely. If I pick two, it's still not very good, but it's already better. It's already a little bit better. And if I pick three, it will not be bad. With three, it's not bad. Look at it. For 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 data that has a lot of noise, this. This is, is not bad. And I can keep making my model more and more complex in the attempt to that it will adjust better, but then it will start to look strange. Look at this one. This one is very interesting because if I don't know the true process and I am naive, I can say, oh my god, this one is perfect. This one is the best one. This one explains the data perfectly. It's a great model. The, the, the error on the, on, the, on the test set is zero or next to zero. I think that it's perfectly zero. So I have a perfect explanation for my data. But uh, if I keep, if I choose new points, and, and if, if, I, if I ask my, even if I don't have the true process, if I just, uh, ask the true process to give me more data, I will say that this model stinks. It's horrible. It's much worse than the model with just, uh, four, with just uh, order three. Uh, this is a model that we say, and, and again, the technical name, this is a model that overfits. Overfits. I gave too much freedom to the model, and now the model doesn't adjust just to the, to, the, to the data, it adjusts to the noise as well. And a good sign that the model is overfitting is taking a look at the model here. Let's take a look at the good model. This, this one is not good. This one is not horrible. It's not the best one, but it's not horrible. Take a look at the coefficients in the model here. They are not that big, but if I go to a model that really, really, really overfits, then I start to find very large coefficients, like 400, minus, and, and the coefficients that oscillate a lot, plus 400, minus 300. And this, this, is, this is not a good sign. This bodes not well for this model. So, a maximum likelihood, or this attempt to make the model, to make the data believable, is dangerous. Is dangerous. Because if you make the data the most believable possible, you will attempt to explain the data perfectly. And you have to be careful about that, because attempting to make the data the most believable possible is to attempt to, 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 to just pretend that the noise doesn't exist. To pretend that the noise doesn't exist. And if you do maximum likelihood blindly, you will have models that overfit. Models that overfit. Uh, another problem, and, you, and this is a... Uh, <coughs> Another problem with uh, ignoring uh, 
the dangers of micro, mass likelihood is that if you if, if you if you ask, if you make some uh, assumptions, for example, I'm assuming that my my errors are normal, and then I have uh, some points, for example, that have uh, extra error. For uh, here I have all points that come from from the process. The, 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 those are points that really come from the process and that have small uh, errors because the, I'm, I'm sampling the errors from the normal distribution. But this is a point that doesn't come from the process. Uh, my, my students uh, uh, mistyped this point. When my student was copying the data from, I don't know, the terminal to Excel, uh, there was a typo here. And uh, I have one point in the data set that is much, that deviates a lot from the data. Uh, see how this single point completely uh, dominates, dominates uh, this section of, of, the, of the function. And this again happens because I'm trying to make the data believable. And it's really not believable, it's really not believable that the function uh, passes through here and uh, that it generates uh, a point of data so far away from the curve. So uh, maximum likelihood has, has its problems that, that, that we have to, to be careful about. Uh, the thing that I, uh, that, that I have to, to warn you is that, of course, this is a very statistical or hard statistical view of, of, of how things work and that you won't find the, this explicit view uh, in, in the code or the examples or in the blogs or even some, most of the papers. So you have to be able to translate. Uh, when you talk about maximum likelihood, and you, you are talking about classical inference, and you're talking about the likelihood functions, and you're talking about that. And uh, usually you, you won't find this kind of language, neither in the papers, neither in the blogs. You talk about uh, some error uh, function, some cost function that you are trying to, to minimize. You have a training set. Uh, in your training set, uh, you have uh, the data and the labels. You, in this training set, you are trying to minimize <coughs> some difference between the labels that you have and the labels that you are predicting. And this cost function is what you are trying to minimize. There is no notion of likelihood anywhere. Uh, in the model, and uh, yet, even in, the, in, the, in this kind of context, uh, often there is some implicit notion of, 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 this, of this framework of maximum likelihood, because you are minimizing the errors. You are trying to find the model that makes you have the least number of mistakes possible. So the, the, spirit, the, the spirit of maximum likelihood survives uh, when you're doing, for example, regression, often the, the only thing that you're doing is minimizing what we call the quadratic loss. When you are uh, in a model like that, uh, the, the only thing that you're actually doing uh, the only thing that you're actually doing is that you have this error bars, this, this red error bars here, and uh, what you're doing is that you're minimizing the sum of the squares of the error bars. So, wh where is this famous likelihood I'm talking about? Well, if you are minimizing the sum of the square of the errors under the assumption that the, mod that the noise is Gaussian, you are picking up the maximum likelihood model. The least squares model under the assumption that the noise is Gaussian is the maximum likelihood model. So be aware of that, that this maximum likelihood uh, idea is often implicit. There is something else that I want to show you in this, in this example. And this example, I think it's in the, um, I, I think it's available for you, uh, Roseli. Mm -hmm. Yes? So you can play with that uh, after. You, you, you can play more with this model later. Is that choosing the right complexity is, is difficult. Because it depends on a series of stuff. For example, this model sucks. It's really not good. But uh, if I start to have a lot of samples, 
if I have a lot of samples, suddenly it's not that bad anymore. If I have lots of samples, then a model with, with uh, coefficient 8 becomes a good model again. And uh, even, if I don't, I, even if I don't have that many samples, if, even if I have less samples than that, if uh, my noise, if I have a small noise, uh, if I have a very small noise, then this model, again, it's not that bad. So how, how good or how bad this model is depends on how many points I have, how noisy the data is. So picking the right model complexity is difficult. It's, it's not uh, very easy. Uh, and this will make our, our deep learning adventure particularly uh, problematic. Because here I'm showing you models that uh, have, uh, I don't know, uh, five, uh, ten parameters. But when you we'll do deep learning, we'll do models that have, uh, as I say, hundreds of millions of parameters. That's my PowerPoint. So coming back, there are, th this is the thing that I want you to, to keep in mind for, for, for what follows, is that picking the, model picking the best model complexity, picking the right model complexity, instead of one that underfits or overfits, it's not obvious. And uh, especially avoiding this kind of problem, uh, it's, it's not easy. I have uh, basically two choices. One, that I can have lo lots of data, as I showed you. If I have lots of data, a model that was overfitting may no longer overfit. And the other choice uh, is that I can control the coefficients to force them to not become too big. Remember when I showed you the model that overfits that I have uh, coefficients that become uh, uh, 400 minus 300, etc. I can put some cost on the size of those coefficients to let to not let the model grow too much. I can give the model the freedom to have a lot of parameters, but not <coughs> give the model the freedom to make these parameters too large. And this choice is what we call the choice of regularization. I can give a lot of data, or I can regularize the model. And on deep learning, we will do both. We will use lots of data. Uh, deep learning models are very greed, greedy in terms of data. And we will use, uh, usually implicitly, we will do a lot of regularization, usually implicitly. So. That's, that finishes the, the discussion about uh, the issues of model complexity. Do you have questions now? Really? Does that mean that you understood nothing? <laughs> how, how, how do you choose where to stop? How do you choose what, which feeding is better? Okay. In practice. Okay. In practice, you do validation. In theory, you should have some prior information on the model that, you, you, that could let you pick the regularization. Uh, but in practice, you do validation. In practice, when you have the test set, the test where you have the annotations, you take a, a part of your test set and use this test set to measure how good the model is doing. And then you can try, for example, several uh, several values for n, for example, in this case, I could try all those, those models, I could try all those models and separate a few points, I could pick a few points to let them separate and measure how well those different models perform on those points that are separate for validation and pick the model that performs best on the validation side. More questions? Yes. What would you put there so everyone side is in the 
I, I emphasize the Gaussian because almost always you assume a Gaussian error. Not always, but almost often you assume a Gaussian error. And the reason for, for that is, is twofold. The first is that Gaussian errors are really, really, really convenient. When you assume Gaussian deviations, you, you gain a lot of analytical convenience. For example, uh, under, Gaussian, uh, un under Gaussian deviations, the, least the, the linear regression has a closed form solution in the form of the least squares. You, you don't even have to do convex optimization. You can just do, for example, the SVD, compute the pseudo inverse, and have a closed form solution to find the, the, best, uh, the best solution. So it's really convenient to pick up the normal or Gaussian deviations. The second reason, which is, let's say, best justified, is that if you don't have any information other than a rough idea of the deviation, if you don't have uh, any, any extra reason to make better assumptions than to believe that uh, you have some fixed deviation in your data, the best distribution to pick is the Gaussian, independently whether or not the data are produced by a Gaussian or not. And the reason for that is that for a given standard deviation, the Gaussian is what we call the maximum entropy distribution. For a given, for a given variance, the Gaussian is the maximum entropy distribution. That means that the Gaussian introduces the least amount of assumptions into your model given a, give, uh, a certain variance. Uh, so from a Bayesian point of view, and, and I'm always speaking a Bayesian point of view, from a Bayesian point of view, if you have to make some assumptions given a certain variance, you are forced to pick the Gaussian. Any other distribution that you pick will make uh, extra assumptions that you don't have the right to make. Yes? There are some classical choices. So the question was, is, is, there, a, a, is there a determined, a fixed number of points that I, or is there a fixed proportion for the, the validation set? For example, if I have 100 training points, how many should be in the, in the actual training and how many should be in the validation? And there are some, classical partitions, so 80-20% uh, is the minimum, and uh, I don't know, 50-50 would be the maximum. 20-80 uh, uh, and 30-70 are very classical choices. But no, a priori, there is no, no, no different choice. The, the thing is, normally data is precious, you, the data is scarce, you don't have that much data. And you want to use the data for training, you don't want to use the data for validation. So you usually want to use as much data as possible for the training. But if you pick a validation set that is too small, it will be too noisy and it won't help you to actually select the hyperparameters. So the rule of the thumb is that you want to use as few points as possible to use the validation that is still uh, makes sense, that it still is reliable. Okay, for some cases, uh, the difference is not that big in practice. So uh, the choice here, and, and this again is a technical, it's a technical, it's a technical term. Here I have an input, and uh, I made a transformation on my input. Remark, this is something that I forgot to say. Remark that I made a transformation on my input that is not linear. The, 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 the input suffered 
a transformation which is not linear. And still, the model remains linear. I'm, I'm calling that linear regression. Why is that so? Why is that so that I can call this linear regression if the data is suffering? This is not linear. This is not linear. Why, why is the model still linear? Exactly. The important thing for this kind of model is that it remains linear on the parameters. All, all, the, all the, the, the analysis, all the optimization will be on the W parameters. So provided that the model, that, that the parameters remain linear, I don't care what happens to the, to the input. And the transformation here on the input is quite arbitrary. So I can pick up different, what is sometimes called the basis functions. I can pick some different basis functions. And here, my basis functions, if, if you want, my basis functions are 1, x, x squared, etc., etc. But I could have picked, for example, uh, Fourier basis instead of polynomial basis, and probably the model would work. And uh, when things are well behaved, uh, usually this choice doesn't make much difference. When things are badly behaved, usually it doesn't make difference as well because nothing works. <laughs> but when you are in this kind of gray zone that things are bad, badly behaved but not that badly behaved, usually someone finds which basis function works the best, uh, implicitly or explicitly. Again, you won't find uh, never in a given machine learning paper the term basis functions. It's not not often that you find it is explicit. But someone finds something that works in, uh, in a form of feature extraction, if you want. Uh, using this kind of basis functions is a form of feature extraction. So you, when you have badly behaved cases, someone will find features that works, and uh, everyone else will follow. All, all the, all the, until someone else finds better features, and everyone else will move to those features. So if, if you want, th this, this is what we would call feature engineering in practice. One, one, extra, one last question? Yes. Yeah, for example, uh, the cost function is what you are trying to optimize here. So I didn't show the optimization. We will talk about the optimization later. But um, let, me, let me go back to the, to the Mathematica. I hope that I didn't have. Uh, so here, here for example, uh, what I'm actually doing, what I'm actually doing, and I, I didn't show, uh, is that what I'm actually doing here is that I'm minimizing the sum of the squares of those, er, of those red error bars. And this is my, what I'm calling my, my, my cost function. And I can pick best cost functions that avoid overfitting. For example, I can put the absolute value or even the square, either the absolute value or the square of those coefficients in my cost function. And now I'm minimizing not only the, the square of the errors, but I'm also minimizing the cost of my model. I'm, I'm putting a term on the model to regularize the model. This is the technical term. I'm putting a regularization term in the model to avoid the, the, the coefficients to getting too big. And this will give me a better, a more smooth model. Uh, the thing is that those things are not magical. Then I'll have two terms in my cost function. One term we'll call the data attachment term, which will be the, the red bars. And the other term will be the regularization terms, which will be the sum of the squares or the sum of the absolute values of the, of, of the models. And I have to weight both terms. I have, to, I have to choose how much I want the first term to weight and the second term to weight. Uh, and to pick up the correct weight, and again, I will usually have to do validation. I'll have to, I'll have to do validation to choose uh, how to put the two things in perspective. Okay. So, moving on to the next part. So, 
this, this what is what we had, so let's summarize uh, what we did. We have uh, a supposition on how my data, uh, where my data comes from. And here, here is the data that I'm putting a lot of suppositions. And I, I really, if, if, I, if I'm stating that, that means that I know a lot about my data. Usually, I, I, don't, I usually don't know that. Usually, I just say, OK, my labels come from my image. And that's all. I don't really know how uh, my, my, my image generate my labels. So th this, is, this is a very, very well-behaved model. But more important than that is that I will state, and, and this is mandatory, I have to do that. If I don't do, do that, I cannot estimate uh, the model. I will say, OK, I don't know how the data comes to exist, but this is how I will estimate uh, the model. So th this, this part here in the bottom is mandatory. And according to the relationship between those two parts, uh, my model can be more statistically, um, how say, how can I say, Aut authoritarian or not. Uh, I, I can, if, if I state more assumptions here, I can say to my colleagues, OK, this is the best model possible. Uh, and I can prove that. I can, I can write a theorem on the blackboard to say that this is the best model for this kind of data. Or <laughs> I can tell my colleague, OK, I cannot prove you that the model is, is the best, but I run some experimentations that show that the model works. So the difference uh, here on, on how authoritarian this model is, is whether or not I'm making those assumptions. For complex stuff, like for ImageNet, uh, uh, ImageNet uh, competition, we, we won't be able to state this kind uh, of assumption. So let's build deep learning from there. Let's build deep, deep learning from there. Uh, deep learning, in my opinion, are just glorified linear regression. <laughs> and I, I want to show you why. Why do I think that the deep learning is glorified? linear regression. The first thing that I want to, to do is move from, from this one variable regression model to a one variable classification model. And this is what I did here. From here to here, and pay attention here to this part on, on the bottom. Uh, here, here we have the classic linear regression. And now the only thing that I actually did is that I put a nonlinearity on the output. This is a nonlinear model. This model is no longer linear. And it's nonlinear because I made a nonlinear transformation on the parameters. And this is a classification model. Uh, this model works like that. I have the input variable here. For the input variable, I can have uh, labels which are 0 or 1. And I want to estimate a model that says who, is, who will be 0, who, is, who will be 1. And my model is this kind of logistic sigmoid function. And the model predicts that everyone from here to here will be 0, and everyone from here to here will be 1. Okay? Uh, the model adjusts quite well to the data, except for this point and this point. And this explains why, why the logistic is not that uh, convinced. If, uh, this, if I switch this point with this point, my logistics become a step function. It becomes a step function, and the logistics will say, OK, those points are 0, and those points are 1. Remark that, for example, for, for, for this point that is uh, here, I don't know, here is 1, 1 half. For the point one half, the logistic will say, OK, I don't know. I don't know what this point is. The logistic will say, OK, 50% here. Uh, so this is a classification model, nonlinear. And this is a neural network. This is, this is your first neural network. Logistic regression is extremely well studied in statistics. It's a model that is very, very well studied in statistics. It's a model that is, is still very well behaved. It doesn't have a closed form solution 
as linear regression have. You cannot solve that by least squares. But you can find this W value with convex optimization, which means that there is a convex procedure. When you find the, the, the best local minimum in your optimization procedure, the best local minimum is the best global minimum. You cannot get stuck into, into local minima. So this is a fairly, fairly well-behaved model. Uh, anyone who has worked on neural networks has maybe seen this, the hyperbolic tangent. The hyperbolic ta tangent is used as the activation function of uh, nonlinear neural networks. So nonlinear networks often will be the, the hyperbolic tangent of double x. Wx and this term, uh, this noise doesn't appear because now we have I, y hat is the hyperbolic tangent of y of w x, uh, hat of x, and this is the simplest neural network that we can have. It's a neural network that doesn't have any hidden layers. I don't have any hidden. It's a one-layer neural network. Uh, this function, this nonlinear function in the neural network community is usually called an activation function. Uh, on the statistics community, this is called usually a link function, a link function. But they, they come to the same. The interesting thing to observe here is that the, uh, the logistic sigmoid and the hyperbolic tangent, they are exactly the same function. It's not that they are approximately the same function. They are exactly the same function. The only difference between the two is a scalar. A scalar is scaling uh, on the input and the output. <coughs> so really, uh, the logistic regression is literally a one-layer uh, neural network. So let's make things a little bit more complex. Uh, the first thing that, the, that we have to do is to start working with several variables. We are not going to make interesting stuff with one variable uh, regression, but this is not very complicated. This is the graph of a two variable in the input, one variable in the output uh, linear regression. So no mystery here. Uh, those models are, again, very well behaved. Uh, usually what I'll have, I'll have a dozens of variables in the input, dozens of variables in the output. I cannot plot that without giving a headache, but they are not more conceptually complex than that. And of course, I will want to put some nonlinearity here. So I will have, again, nonlinear regression with several variables. And then the only thing that remains to make our neural networks is to make several layers. And that's it. That, this is a, what we call multi-layer perceptron. Uh, this is a, is a multi-layer perceptron. Here I have a linear model. Here I have a non-linear model. This phi thingy is my activation function. I can pick uh, whatever. For example, I can pick the, tangent, the hyperbolic tangent here. And then, in the output of my, of my first layer of the model, I will plug another linear model. So this here, the w dot phi, etc., is another linear model, where I will plug another activation function. Again, it can be another hyperbolic tangent. And now I have a two-layer non-linear model. And I can do that again and again and again and again and again and again. And I'll have what is usually called a multi-layer perceptron. And, 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 and that's, that's what uh, a, a, a neural network is. So note that it is more complex than what we saw earlier. As soon as I have two layers, things become hairier in terms of optimization. Op optimizing a two-layer uh, 
uh, two-layer perception is no longer a convex procedure, so I have no longer guarantees that the optimization will converge. I, I, I will have numerical difficulties. Numerically, this is more pro problematic, uh, but conceptually, it's not that more complicated. It's not that more complicated. There is, there is not a conceptual mystery here. Let's take a closer look at what's happening here. Uh, so this, this is just the equation that I show in the previous page. I, I didn't change anything here. I'm estimating my output. This is, I'm estimating my output from my input. For example, this can be my image, and this can be my, my label, uh, whether or not this is a car or a horse. Or, if you want, this can be a, several, a set of measurements, a set of phys uh, physical measurements, and this can be another set of physical measurements. So this can be either a classification or a regression model. It, th there's not much of a difference. And wh what I'm doing here, it, th this is a drawing of, of the equation just to make things clearer. My input will be a vector. My input will be a vector. And the output of the first layer will be this vector multiplied by some matrix, by some matrix, that will give me another vector. So this multiplication here, this is just matrix multiplication. This dot here is to, is to reinforce that this is our, those are internal products. But really, those are just matrix multiplications. And so I multiply a matrix by a vector, and I get another vector. And then I apply phi, and I apply it element-wise. So one element of w, Wx become one element here, one element, one element. So this is element-wise. And for example, this is the hyperbolic tangent, or the, the logistic sigmoid, or even simpler stuff. And this, just I, I pick this vector and I apply element-wise nonlinear function here. And this becomes the output of the first layer. And then I do this again. Then I just do this again. I take this vector, this input vector, this input vector, I multiply by the, sec by the matrix in the second layer, and I get a vector, and then I apply the nonlinearity, and I do this again, and again, and again, and again, and again. When I, when I get tired, when the exercise becomes boring, I get the output, and I give the output to the user. Okay? There are some restrictions here. Is that, for example, the dimensions of this matrix must be compatible with the dimensions of the input, and the dimensions of this last matrix must be compatible with the dimensions of the output. But that's all. The internal dimensions may be completely arbitrary. And what I will estimate in the model, the thing to be estimated in the model, are the matrices. I will estimate W1, W2, Wn. Remark that the, uh, the, the nonlinear functions, they give power to the model. The, mo the model becomes more powerful with the, with the nonlinear functions. But the nonlinear functions, they are not learned. They are fixed. So uh, neural networks are ways to isolate the nonlinear part, which becomes fairly restricted, from the linear part, which is the part that I actually learn. I only learn the linear transformations. So those matrices are the parameters that I learn. OK, so just to reconcile that with the connectivist view, let's make the, the connection between. This is, the way we, this, is the, this is my favorite way to see the networks. I, 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 don't, I find that this interesting to use this metaphor, usually. But this metaphor breaks down very quickly. So th this, is, this, is, this is useful at, at, at some point. It's, it's useful to have this in mind. Uh, to make some uh, architectural decisions, etc. 
but I actually find this view uh, usually more profitable. But it's even more profitable to have both, to have both views and be able to move from one to the other. So let's, let's see how to do that. If we select one neuron from a particular la layer, so let's, I'm picking here, this is the input. So th this, this, this is just the input. This is not a, a layer proper. So though this thing here is this vector here. This, this little circles here is this vector here. Each circle is the component in the vector. And now what I'm doing is that I'm isolating one, one neuron on the first layer. And one neuron on the first layer, you will remember, is a sum of products, a sum of the products of the input. And this corresponds exactly, it's not approximately, this corresponds exactly to what a row in this in this matrix uh, does. I'm showing here as a column, but just because of the drawing, to make the drawing more, more compelling. But this is a row in the matrix. I'll have as many rows as I have neurons here. So here I have one, two, three, four, five, six. I'll have six rows. And each row will have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight uh, elements. And each row corresponds to one internal product. And this row corresponds to this neuron. The linear part of the output is one scalar. Uh, and then I apply the nonlinear transformation. And then this output, what comes in this part uh, of the neuron, is this. And this is propagated to everyone in the next layer. So this thing enters, enters on, on well, I have to, to, to watch the geometry. I don't know if it's here or here. <laughs> but this thing enters on the next, uh, on, on the next layer as, a, as an input for every neuron, probably here. This, this thing enters here, and every neuron will have a copy of, of, this, of this output. So the, the two, the two, uh, the two views, the, the the connectivist view, and this more algebraic or statistical view, are really one and the same. Really one and the same. Okay. Questions so far? Is this easy? Okay, because now what, what we will do, what we will see, but I'm hesitating to start that. Let's just take a look quickly uh, on, on what will come, because we are getting close to the, to the, to the break. But, but let's, let's take a look at what, what, what we will talk about, is that this kind of model, this, this, this kind of fully connected model, it will be useful. It will be useful for some tasks, but it's fairly limited. In particular, I cannot do deep learning just using this kind of thing. Uh, the, the deep learning revolution didn't came from, from this kind of fully connected uh, multi-layer uh, multi model. Uh, and in particular, for image classification, uh, this kind of model is not very good. So I have to introduce a different kind of network, uh, which, which are the convolutional networks. So th there is, there is a, a change here uh, in terms of which kind of network we will use to build the deep learning, uh, which are the convolutional networks. And the, the reason why, and I'll go through here quickly, and then w after the break we will move here, we will go a little bit slower. And the, the reason why I will use convolutional networks is that uh, this kind of uh, this kind of uh, architecture uh, interprets 
the input or each layer is interpreted as simply as a vector. You see that, for example, the input, I take it as a vector and I do a, a matrix multiplication. And the next layer will be the same thing. The output of this layer is considered as a vector and I'll do a matrix multiplication. The output of this layer is considered as a vector and I'll do matrix multiplication, etc. But an image, uh, interpreting an image as simply, as simply as a vector is possible. It's not forbidden. An image does behave as a vector, but doing so discards a lot of structure uh, on the image. An image doesn't have just uh, algebraic structure. It also has a topological structure because uh, each pixel has neighbors. And interpreting the image just as a vector does a disservice because I draw away this extra information. And the problem of, of, of doing that is that small changes in the image become huge changes in the vector. Small, little, little, little local changes in the image become huge changes in the vector. And my network will have to learn to undo these changes by force, by brute force. And that doesn't work very well. And uh, when I, I do the learning on the images, I want to be invariant to a lot of stuff. So the solution is to use convolutional networks in which the layers won't, will not be simply uh, internal products, but I will use this idea that I have a convolution mask. I I learn this kind of structure uh, that I will use to filter the image. So th this, is, this is what a convolution in an image is. Uh, it's, 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 it's not different from, a, from what a discrete convolution is for, for any function. What I'm doing here is that I decided uh, th this is a, a function, a discrete function that represents my image. So this is a particular input just to illustrate uh, uh, the operation. So this is an image that is black everywhere, but in the center. In the center, there is a single white pixel. And then what I did is that I did a padding. To be able to, to apply the mask everywhere, I, I, did, uh, I, I, I put a, a, a black margin. I did the padding around the image. And now what I'm doing is that I'm putting my convolution mask in each position. Each position I'm putting my convolution mask. And the result is the sum of the products. The result, again, is the internal product. It's the local internal product. I'm taking each number. This times this, 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 this times this. And I take the sum of those products as the output. Because the image is zero everywhere, it's zero everywhere, uh, except for a single point, uh, in here the convolution, the convolution just copies the, the mask backwards. So the mask is 9, 8, 7, uh, 6, 5, 5, 4, etc. And the result is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Okay. Uh, after the break, I will show you a little in more detail how the convolution can do stuff, do interesting stuff. We will ex uh, explore a little bit uh, uh, why convolutions on, on, on images a little, uh, are a good idea. And we will talk quickly how convolutions, uh, how convolutional networks work. And we will talk about some particularities of, uh, of the convolution in deep networks. That there is a little bit of extra complexity on how convolutions work in deep learning. And finally, we will, we will see how, uh, how those convolutions represent more and more high-level concepts as I progress through the network. So all this after the break. Thank you very much so far. See you after the break. Thank you.
focus this fully connected network scheme uh, to work, especially to work with images, but why we will use the convolutional networks. Uh, so what I, what I was explaining is that this kind of solution uh, fails to exploit all the structure present in the images. Well, what I do here when I, when I use a, a fully connected layer is that I simply take each pixel, I take each single pixel, and I consider it one as one element in the input vector. Uh, if I have more than one channel, if I have a color image, it's even more strange because I will consider each component of each channel and each pixel of each component uh, of, of the multi-channel image as one completely independent uh, information. Uh, and this, this scheme, of course, fails to take into account the fact, for example, that the one particular red component is attached to a particular blue component, or that the one particular pixel is neighbor to another particular pixel. And that will be extremely inefficient, especially when I want to have some invariance. Here, for example, the image moves two pixels to the left, and the vector changes completely. The vector becomes a completely different vector. Uh, then you pose a problem, because now my network has to learn by itself how to do to undo this kind of, tra of transformation. I, I, I'm putting a lot of heavy work into the layer to try to undo this, this kind of transformation. And uh, if this layer cannot uh, undo this variance, this layer will just uh, uh, translate or, or will just uh, how does it propagate? It's the word that I'm, um, I'm picking. This layer will just propagate this kind of uh, uh, variation to the next layer, and, we'll, and the, the entire network will be contaminated. The, the input changes, the first layer cannot, uh, uh, cannot undo this kind of, of variation. We'll propagate this variation to the next layer, and the next layer will propagate the transformation to the next layer, and so on. And so it will be very, very hard to undo this kind of, of, of problem. And of course, uh, translations are the least, the least of my problems. I have uh, uh, things like scale changes, uh, missing, missing points, rotations, slight, uh, uh, slight deformations, and uh, of course, combined, uh, combined transformations. And I want to be invariant to all those stuff. That's when a convolutional networks enter. Convolutional networks enter to solve this problem. And convolutional networks have been with us for a long time. Uh, we can even perhaps argue that deep uh, neural networks are born with uh, convolutional networks. The, the, the LENET is one case of uh, deep convolutional networks that has existed since uh, the 90s, uh, Mathieu? Lenet, uh, the late 90s, late 90s, 99. And uh, it was a network that was extremely successful for this particular task, which is a handwritten digit recognition uh, in, in this data set that is known as the MNIST digit data set. So I have a small, it, those are small images, uh, 28 by 28 pixels, and each image has a single digit. Each image has a single digit. The, it, digit of, the digits, of course, go from 0 to 9, so I have 10 classes. And the task here, uh, the aim here was to do digit recognition for zip codes, for, for American zip codes. And it's 
far from easy at the origin, originally, this data set was far from easy, was considered far from easy, because you have lots of variation. If I take, for example, number two or number seven, uh, you, you can see that we can lots of uh, different uh, variations. And we can, even, we can even have some things that start to confound. For example, is this a one or is this a seven? Uh, and and this, this, this poses a lot of, of, of difficulty to, to, to work. For example, this, this five is discontinuous. I have two, two, two traces. And at the time, people were trying to do ad hoc uh, stuff uh, and to do feature extraction to do this and, uh, and manual recognition. And it was really, really, really hard to come up with uh, hard-coded rules that worked every, every time. For example, people tried to come up with ideas that if I have one a circle, uh, two continuous regions, uh, it will be a zero, and if I have two, it's an eight. But then you have things like that that broke completely your, your rule-based decision. And then it became clear that we, we cannot approach this kind of task by just rule-based uh, algorithms, and that we have to do statistical learning. We have to do some kind of statistical learning. And uh, the idea of Lanet was to use those convolutional networks. So uh, just quickly, again, the, the idea of convolution is to have those, those masks, those, those masks that I can make them go through my image, and as they go through my image, I put them pixel by pixel. Uh, I make them go pixel by pixel, and at each pixel, I compute the sum of the products. So each output pixel is the sum of the products of the input pixel in that, in that window and the mask. And uh, uh, this has a lot of advantages, because it's the sum of the products, this will be a linear uh, operation, so the, the, the convolution is a completely linear operation, uh, but yet, although it's a very simple linear operation, etc., it has a lot of power. Uh, so let's 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 see what what I mean by by, by the power of uh, of the convolution. Yes. Okay, this is, a, this, this is a technical detail. This is a, this is a very technical detail. And in signal processing, they make uh, a distinction that we, we, will, we won't actually care here. For us, it's the same. For us, machine learners, is locally we consider it the same. But for signal processing people, it, there is really a difference. When you don't rotate the max, they call this kind of operation correlation operation. You have to rotate the mask to, 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 to consider that the convolution. And the motivation, if you want, you see that if you rotate the mask, uh, the impulse response, which is this kind of single picture, pixel, the impulse response is the original mask. You see? You have to rotate the, ma the mask for the impulse response to, to reconstruct the original mask. If you don't rotate the mask, the impulse response rebuilds the inverted mask. So you have to invert to, for the inversion to rebuild the. But, but th this is the kind of technical detail that is important to. It's mathematically important to, get, to have some pro properties, and it's important to, for signal processing people, but for us, uh, it won't be very important. Yes. Yes, because, because the parameters will be learned, we don't care. We learn them already inverted. But when, 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 when you need to prove some properties of the convolution, you, you have to take that in, into consideration. So let's take a look at this convolution thing. <coughs> Uh, so here is my my image. This is my my image. This, this side is the original image, and this side is the image after 
I applied the convolution. And this here on top is the convolution mask. This is the convolution mask. And it's interesting to see that with a mask of convolution, I can do things like highlighting horizontal edges. Here I have, for example, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. Yes. I don't think I can do that. You see? There is a zoom. OK, let's see if we are lucky. OK. Now it's too much. OK, let's find the Goldilocks, Goldilocks zoom. That's good? OK, thank you, because I, I didn't, I, I never noticed this very conspicuous. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I can do things like uh, uh, highlighting uh, horizontal edges, vertical edges. You see, what, what, because I'm doing for each pixel, I'm taking the, the central pixel uh, will be here, and I'm taking the sum of the products of the pixels. You see that this one is taking, for example, those pixels and taking the negative of those pixels and adding to the positive of those pixels. So effectively, taking those and subtracting from those. So th this is, a, this is a, an operation that, that, that highlights those uh, horizontal lines or vertical edges. I can blur. For example, this is a, a, a mask that just takes the average for all nine pixels. This is one over nine. I take one over nine from everyone. So it's, it's not very easy to see, but here I just, I, I have the image a little bit blurred in comparison to this one. Uh, and I can have things, for example, if I, ah, I don't want negative. Yes? The size of the mask has some influence. Because, for example, if, I, if I'm taking the blur from a small mask, for a 3x3 three three mask, this will be a much less intense blur than if I take a blur from a 5x5 five five mask. So the size of the mask matters. Size of the mask matters. But the size of the mask has another influence, because taking the sum of the products of nine elements, it's much cheaper. <laughs> It's 2.5 times cheaper than taking the, the sum of the products of 25 elements, which is a 5x5 five five, uh, mask. So masks may grow, but they will usually not grow too much. So 3x3 three three is common, 5x5 five five is common, 7x7 seven seven is common, 9x9 nine nine is not common. It's not common. I'm sorry? Uh, it's almost always odd, so you have a central pixel. It's not mandatory, because then you have some uh, shift, but it's not, a, it's not that big of a shift when the, the pixel is not perfectly centralized. But in practice, it's almost always odd. Other questions? No? You, you can do the interesting thing to, to see here I, I just want to show two things. Let me see if I can. Th th this is not really the best interface to, to play with the math. But if I put zero everywhere, if I put zero everywhere, except for the center, for the center. And if I put one in the center, so I have this mask zero everywhere but one in the center, then I have this kind of identity mask that does, does nothing, that does nothing. And the masks are linear, so this is also very important to realize that if I applying one mask, applying another mask, and doing the sum of the images is the same thing as 
summing the two masks and then applying to the image. So th this has a lot of good properties. This has a lot of good properties. And, and the model remains fairly linear with, uh, essentially linear uh, with, those, uh, with those convolutions. But the thing to realize uh, here is that the, those convolutions allow to make uh, operations, to make things that make sense for images. That make sense for images. In images, often we, we want to do things like that. I want to, ha to, to have the, the image a little bit smooth so I can fill up the, the missing points. I want to find the horizontal edges. I want to find the vertical edges, etc., etc., etc. So this kind of operation makes a lot of sense in terms of feature extraction. If I want to learn feature extraction from the pixels, this kind of mask makes a lot of sense. Now, how do I go back here? Okay, PowerPoint, you have to work with me. Oh. What's happening here? Okay. So, let's see the structure of those convolutional networks. The thing with convolutional networks is that the fully connected layers don't disappear. They don't completely disappear. But I will leave the fully connected layers in the end of the network. The end of the network. They are the upper layers of the network. And close to the input, the first layers, the layers close to the input, will be convolutional layers. And the structure of the layer is usually a convolution and some kind of subsampling. Some kind of subsampling. That may be either an operation that, which is called the pooling or doing the convolution with a stride different than one. And what does this mean? Pooling, which is the easier, the, the most obvious kind of subsampling, I take, uh, for example, four pixels, and I take the average of those four, four pixels. I take the next four pixels, and I take the average of those four pixels, etc., etc. So this is the pooling. And the most common forms of pooling are either the average pooling. I take from each uh, two lines, two columns, I take the average. Or more, more commonly, the max pooling. It's, it's, the max pooling is more common than the average pooling. From each... Uh, for pixels, I take the maximum value. And the, the stride, which is another way to do the, the subsampling, instead of putting the mask in every pixel, I can put the mask in every other pixel. So putting the mask on every other pixel also will cut my image by half. It's a form of doing a subsampling. And the, the interesting thing about the subsampling is that the, uh, attaching the convolutions to the subsampling forces uh, this kind of invariance that we want to happen. Because if I, if I apply, for example, this kind of blurred mask uh, to a certain point, uh, to a certain region, for example, here I have this kind of shift that has uh, completely changed my representation. But if I do, in this region, this kind of averaging with a blur mask, and then I do the subsampling. Uh, the information that will go to the next layer will be the exactly same information uh, or very close information uh, with the shift or without the shift. So the combination of different types of masks that may average out the, the information and the averaging effect or decision effect of the pooling will provide the kind of invariance that I'm looking for. So the convolution networks exploit the extra structure, the extra neighborhood structure of the image to allow, to create a mechanism that uh, provides the invariance that I'm looking for. Uh, one thing that is also interesting to, to be here is that so far in the examples that, that we saw, we saw this kind of 2D convolution in which I'm, I'm applying 
uh, a matrix to the, to the data. But in deep learning, I will exploit this kind of 3D convolutions that will be very, very powerful. So if my input image is a color image, I will have uh, the X and Y dimensions, but I will have an extra dimension, which are the channels of the image. So you have typically R, G, B. I have three channels. And my convolution masks will also reflect this structure because I will have convolution masks which are, for example, five by five by three. The, the convolution masks will also have this uh, three depth uh, layers. And this is interesting, this is very important, and this is more powerful than just applying the convolution to the channels independently, because now I can cross the information between the channels. If I just apply the masks independently to the channels, I can, for example, blur the three channels independently. But with the 3D convolutions, I can do things like take the red channel and subtract the green channel, and I can exploit things. I want to find the borders, but only the borders that are transitions from green to red. And when color is important, where color is important for a given decision, now my convolution masks can exploit that. And this will be even more important as I move not from the input to the first layer, but from uh, a particular internal layer to another. So if I'm moving, for example, here from the, fir from the first layer to the second layer, from the first layer to the second layer, uh, I will have from the first layer the result. Each, each plane is the result from a, a previous filter. So uh, the result, the, uh, an image, I apply a convolution, and I get one image. So each plane here is the result from a previous convolution. And uh, if now I apply my convolution mask, so imagine here that I have a 5 by 5 by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this is my convolution mask that is 5 by 5 by 7. Now what I'm doing is that I'm applying this convolution mask through my image, through my image, crossing and mixing up and doing operations in all my seven layers, in all the seven planes that I have produced from the previous operation. And this, uh, re this convolution will produce uh, one plane, the result for each, uh, each operation will give one scalar that will represent one plane in the output. So if here I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 planes, it's because I have 12 masks or 12 filters in this layer. And then I can do this one time, two times, three times, five times, etc. Each time, uh, the filters mix up all the layers in one, in one layer to produce one layer in the next. And this scheme is extremely powerful. This is extremely powerful. So powerful that what we realize, what we see when we analyze how those filters are activated, we find some very interesting results. So this network here is fairly close, if not exactly close, to AlexNet, which is uh, the first or one of the first networks to win the, the ImageNet competition. Uh, these are the different layers. So this is the input image. The input image to, to, to 224 pixels by 224 pixels by three channels, red, green, blue. This 
is the result from the first layer. So in the first layer, I had already 55 by 55 pixels by 96 depth. Let's analyze what happened here from one layer to the other. Uh, they used the 11 by 11 filter, so a fairly big filter here. I thought that it's unusual to have a, a large filter, but it, it, it may happen. See that most of the filters are fairly small, but sometimes I can have a, a larger filter. So uh, how do I get the 55? Let's do a little, a little, a little math. Uh, when I apply the 55, if I don't do the padding, I lose 10 pixels, if I'm not mistaken. So 2 to 4 minus 10 is 2, 14. And then if I get half of that, is the math correct? Doesn't look like correct. It doesn't seem to work. Doesn't seem to work. Yes, they, they, they tried this different. I started a four. I have to divide by four. Now, now do I get what I want? Yes. Ah, you don't. You don't lose the padding. No. Okay. Does it, does it still work? Because of 55, by, 55 times 4 is 2020. 2020. So I, 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 lost, I, I, lost a small, I lost a small padding. I, I, lost, I lost 4 pixels in each side and divided by 4 with the stride. This is what happened. And I have 96, I have 96 pixels. Sorry, I have 96 filters, 96 filters just like this. Each filter generates a layer in this, in this result. So the next, uh, the next uh, step, I have 55 pixels by 55 pixels by 96 depth. 96 depth. And when we analyze how those filters are activated, which kind of uh, input maximizes the activation of the filters in these first layers, we find this kind of interesting pattern, which are edges and blobs that may be even uh, more grayscale or more color aware. So, Things like that, if, if you have uh, ever seen uh, uh, Gabor filters, you, you see that those, those Gabor filters that take into account uh, direction, uh, frequency, scale, look a lot like that. Look a lot like that. And what, what is interesting also is that neurons from the primary cortex neurons from the primary cortex, also uh, tend to be activated a lot like this kind of pattern. A lot like this kind of pattern. So th th this is something that is very interesting. Also interesting is that as I move towards upper layers in my convolutional network, as I move towards upper layers in my, in my convolutional network, I start to see the emergence of uh, more complex activation patterns that start to look even like uh, parts of objects. Parts of objects. On ImageNet that has a lot of dogs, for example, <laughs> yeah, in the upper layers, you start to see a lot of dog faces in the upper layers, parts of objects. And uh, in, the, in the decision layers, you even start to see this kind of uh, tessellations of, or, or images where you have classes, elements of the class everywhere. So what's happening here is that you, you can argue that each layer is learning to find more abstract, higher level semantical 
uh, elements. And, and this is the power that, that uh, convolutional uh, layers add. We can see that more, perhaps more easily uh, in those images. So this is layer one uh, filters. This is the, the maximum activation for layer one filters. Here is, uh, here is computed images, and here is, is windows in the, in the actual data set. So here again, this is computed filters, and here are I windows in the actual data set. So uh, here again, edges and blobs. Here, things that look more like patterns. Uh, here, we start to see uh, more complex patterns, things that look, start to look like parts of objects. Uh, here, clearly, uh, things that are clearly parts of objects like the flower core, the, the eyes of the, of the animals, etc., and, uh, and the abstraction growing as you move uh, uh, through the, the network. Uh, one thing that is interesting that, that, that's, that's important also to realize is that the, the dense layers do not actually disappear. They do not actually disappear in this scheme. So if you want, if you want to, one, one way to, to see what's happening here is that you can look at the lower layers as feature extraction layers and the upper layers as decision layers and the middle layers as a continuum between the two. So I'm, here I'm doing very primary uh, feature extraction here, I'm actually making a decision about the classes, and that's where the fully connected enter. I have to have this kind of global, fully connected uh, <coughs> structure to really look at everything and make a decision. And uh, in the internal part of the, of the network, I, I'm kind, kind of doing both at, at a time. I, I can see... I, could inter interpret that I'm making local, making local decisions and trying to find parts of objects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I have to say about uh, uh, convolutional networks. Do you have questions about this part? Yes. 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 So the question was, for the fully connected, we have a procedure that we'll see in the next part that is called backpropagation. And the backpropagation is used to learn the weights in the fully connected layers. The question was, do I use backpropagation also to learn the, the, the weights in the convolutional networks? And the answer is yes. Backpropagation is the all-encompassing procedure that it's everything is the anthropophagic learning <laughs> algorithm that, that learns everything, and uh, everything will be learned by backpropagation. More questions? No, really? Yes. Okay. So great question. This is what we are learning. Now, this is what you see right now. So let's talk about training. So let's, let's just summarize what we have seen so far. We have seen so far. Before we enter, this, this is also a toboggan. This is also a, a mathematical toboggan. I think that the, the word in French is, is, is the same. This is the mathematical slide part. Uh, so let's summarize what, what we have seen so far. Uh, we have seen the neural metaphor for what we call neural networks. We have seen the, the biological metaphor for what we call neural networks. Uh, we have seen a little bit why this, why this biological metaphor arises. And then we have moved to a more statistical view, a more statistical view 
of those models, we have exploited a connection between the connectivist view and the more algebraic view. Uh, we have shown how the algebraic view can be built, uh, making more and more complex uh, assumptions, or more complex, uh, adding more complexity to the simple linear regression. So I start with a simple linear regression, I go to a nonlinear logistic regression, and then I make a multi-layer nonlinear regression, and that is already a multi-layer perceptron. And we have seen uh, that if I change some of the first layers, instead of doing uh, the, the fully connected or just internal product thing, if I change them for convolutions, then I have the, the convolutional network. I have the convolutional network. Uh, finally, we have also exploited some problems with estimating those models, still from a purely statistical point of view, some problems with estimating those models is that uh, I can have uh, uh, underfitting, I can have overfitting, uh, choosing the right model complexity is problematic. If I choose to do regularization, which we will do, uh, choosing the, the right amount of regularization is not obvious as well. And let's pick from that. Let's pick from this, this trouble of estimating the model, which uh, estimation is, is the term that we use in statistics. Uh, from the point of view of, of uh, machine learning, we will talk about training, training the model. And, and that's what we're going to do. So, uh, this is what we have, this is what we had. Uh, the only difference if I decided to work with, uh, with uh, the convolutional networks is that instead of having those internal products here, I will have a, a convolutional operation, I have a convolutional, I have a convolutional operation, but that doesn't change it, the, the model very much. And now, what I have to do is to train the model. I have to train the model, and again, training the model consists in finding values for the Ws. This is fixed, this does not change. And the input, I cannot choose. <laughs> I do not choose the input. So the thing that I can choose is values for the Ws. And in order to pick a value for the Ws, I will, what I will do is pick up a cost function. I will pick up a cost function. And this cost will be a function of what I decided as a, an output and what was the actual output. So, here is my network, here is my input, and here is what I'm predicting. This hat here is the y that I'm estimating, the, the y that I'm predicting. But uh, the y that I'm predicting and the actual y are different stuff. They are not necessarily the same. And uh, then I will create this f here, will be a cost function that contrasts those two things, what the thing really was and what I'm saying the thing is. Uh, of course, this will only be, be actually computable if uh, I have access to the true values. So this will only be actually computable if I have a training set. So on my training set, I can have this notion of empirical risk, which is the value of my cost function uh, on my training set. What I said versus what it was. And th this cost function, it may be several things. For example, for, for aggression, it will often be the... the square difference. So if I say 2 and it was uh, 
4, the, the cost will be 4 because 4 minus 2 squared is 4. Uh, and for classification, it, it can be different things. If my classification is predicting probabilities, uh, if my classification outputs, if my output here is a vector of probabilities, uh, this function is often the cross entropy, the cross entropy of uh, what I said versus what I expected, uh, and, what, and what I expected is often 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 on the right class, and 0, 0, 0, 0. And I compute the cross entropy between my prediction and this ideal vector of probabilities. So what I'm doing here is that I'm picking up a cost function. I have to pick up a cost function. And then I will try to minimize my empirical risk. I'll try to minimize my empirical risk. I'll try to make this cost as small as possible on my training set. On my training set. Again, you have to see the ghost of the maximum likelihood here. The, the ghost of maximum likelihood, maximum likelihood is right here because I'm trying to make my training set as believable as possible. I'm trying to make the model as truthful as possible to my training set. So although I'm not in computing probabilities here, I'm not computing uh, the likelihood function here, I, I'm not using this, this statistical language directly this is a maximum likelihood-like uh, procedure because I'm taking my data, I'm taking the data that I actually have, and I'm taking my model and making my model the most, the most adapted possible to the data that I have. And, 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 and that's, that's where the, the maximum likelihood advantages and troubles will arise. But in algorithm terms or in numerical terms, what will actually happen is that I have to minimize this cost. And to minimize this cost, I will take the derivative of the cost and I will go the opposite way. So I'll, I'll just ask the gradient, uh, how do I make, a, where do I go to make the cost as big as possible? And then I will go the opposite way, or if you want, or I will ask, where do I go to get the negative of the cost as big as possible? And then I will go the, that way. Uh, so, cynically, I can forget about all the maximum likelihood, uh, yada, yada, and, and I can just consider that this is the training. The training is picking up one of those parameters and computing this gradient, or the negative, uh, the gradient of the negative of this cost, uh, yes, and then following it. And this is what backpropagation does. Backpropagation is exactly that. We will compute this gradient using backpropagation, and then we will use numerical optimization procedures to do the actual minimization. Uh, I just have to talk. Uh, uh, Quickly, about uh, about uh, I, I. This is something that we have to lose our fear. So let's collectively lose our fear. Equations are just that equations. They don't bite. <laughs> when I used to be a, a postdoc and I had some students working with me, and I asked the students to to read the papers in Brazil. This is a very Brazilian problem. I used to be shocked because the, the students would read the papers and, and they used to, to come back with me with the papers and, and say, okay, I read the paper, they say that and that, and then there are some equations, and they say that and that, and then there are some equations. And they say, okay, have you actually studied the math? Because the math is the only part that actually is interesting in this paper. The, the other things are, are just filler. You are, you, are, you are jumping through the parts that's important. And, uh, Small note to my Brazilian uh, fellow citizens, you cannot go very far in doing research on machine learning. If, if you wanted to just use machine learning as a black box, okay. But if you actually wanted to do research in machine learning, okay, you cannot go very far without math. 
sorry, you have to work with the math. Otherwise, uh, there is not much research to be done. So lose your fear of math. Deal with it. <laughs> and here, what I want to show, which is quite simple, is that we have this loss function. So not, the loss function is the, op, is, is, the, is the cost function. So we have this loss function, which is a function of the input and the, and the output. And the input, because I will use my network, this is my network, this innocent F here is the entire, the entire network, which in the entire network is a function of the input, of course, but it's also implicitly dependent on the parameters, which is represented, all the parameters are represented innocently by this, this, this data. And what I'm trying to find here is this, this, this gradient and now, what I'm, well, the only thing that I'm doing here is take this long, this huge uh, chain rule, this regra da cadeia. So I'm taking this, this, it will be huge, it will be a huge chain rule because I have a huge composition of functions. I have the loss of the last layer of the last to next layer, blah, 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 until I get to the first layer. So it will become a huge. Uh, chain rule. There is one technicality here that is important is because I have some indirect de dependencies of the parameters on the, on, the, on the internal functions, I have to take some, I have to use both the chain rule and something that's called the total derivative rule. So that, that's why some uh, there is derivatives here are partial, and some of the derivatives are total. So there is some technical uh, boring stuff that I'd like to work here, but I won't have time. I have to, to watch the clock. I'm, I see that I'm getting short of time. But the thing here is that in the end, when you want to, when you want to minimize a particular parameter, for example, here I'm, I'm minimizing a parameter for the first layer, which is the worst, the first layer will be the worst, I'll get this huge product, this huge chain rule. This huge chain rule. Uh, remark that here, because I'm maximizing the first layer, uh, a lot of terms will disappear because uh, they will be constant. The derivatives will be constant in terms of this first layer. But the last layer, there will be this huge product. And each one of those partial derivatives is a matrix. And I'll have this huge matrix multiplication. So that's what's happening here. So I have this, this is, this is the, the derivative that I'm trying to compute. I'm trying to find the best value for this matrix, for the first matrix. So I'm trying to find the, the gradient, the direction in which I have to move. This will be this huge product. Each one of those terms is a matrix. And the backpropagation is just an exploitation of associativity. Because I have two options to do this product. Either can I, I can go this way, either I can go this way. Oh, I could go infinite, uh, almost ways, because I can, uh, associativity, I can, I can put the parameters, uh, the parentheses, any way I want. But those are the, are the two obvious ways. I can begin one way or the other way. But the choice is not the same, because this is the easy way to do it. And this is the very hard way to do it. And the reason why this is true is because the last function, this last function is a scalar function. The cost function will always be a scalar function. So this will be a very quick matrix multiplication. And because the, the, the result of this will always, will, will again be uh, a vector will be a uh, one row matrix. So this will be fast, this will be fast, this will be fast, this will be fast, this will be fast. If I decided to do the other way, this one will be, will be expensive because it's a matrix by matrix. This one will be expensive, this one will be expensive, this one will be expensive, and only the last one will be fast. If, if, you, if, you, if you want, uh, this one collapses the matrix the matrix, and because this one collapsed the, mat the matrix, this one will collapse the matrix again, the matrix again, 
this one you collapse the matrix again, this one you collapse the matrix again, this one you collapse the matrix again, and every matrix multiplication will be a vector by matrix multiplication. And if I, if I decide to attack the other way, I will have matrix by matrix, matrix by matrix, matrix by matrix, matrix by matrix, and only the last one, vector by matrix. And that's what backpropagation is. Backpropagation is an exploitation of associativity to have cheap matrix multiplications. You have to use it. It's already slow. <laughs> Even using this trick, it is slow. If, if, you, if you don't use it, it's not feasible. It's not numerically feasible. <coughs> and once you have your, your derivative, because so far, so far, the only thing that we have is the derivative. You just have the, the, <laughs> the, the gradients. Now the optimization begins. Now the optimization begins, because now we can do the gradient descent. And I want to show you this very quickly. I have to resist here the temptation to enter uh, in the details. This is the averaged version of uh, of the of the course that you gave last year uh, it's it's online the the full version is online so you if 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 you go to my youtube channel you you find the the, the full version of this of, of of this one let me, let me see if i can this full screen yes so uh, let's see here. Okay, so this is the loss function. Here is the network. Mikael put phi where I put uh, f, and I'm trying to find the parameters that minimize this loss function, so it's the same thing. Uh, but now I, I will compute the gradient, so it's the same thing. But now I have several options. I have several options. I, I crossed those one because those one I, I want to even go through. I deleted the slides, so I want to even have the temptation <laughs> to go through. Uh, and then I will have these options of very simple, what we call first order optimization algorithms that use just the gradient information. They don't use the, the second derivative information. And the, this comes as a shock to several people from optimization community, and they say, why don't you use <laughs> the second derivative? And the answer is that because the second derivative is just too expensive. It's just too expensive. It's very expensive. I cannot reliably estimate the second derivative, and it, in the end, even if I try, it doesn't work. <laughs> so. Here, the best thing to do is to just do gradient descent and uh, adaptations of gradient descent that uh, adapt very, very roughly sometimes things that have uh, the smell of second order stuff, but not, nothing more than that. So, uh, stochastic gradient descent is very, very simple. You take your parameters, you compute your gradient, and then you apply, you subtract your gradient from your parameters, and that's one step. Then you do that again. At that new point, you compute the gradient again, you subtract it from your parameters, and you do this kind of step. Uh, you have to apply some kind of, of uh, weight to, to the gradient, and the, this weight is called the learning rate. Learning rate. And that is important because uh, uh, if your learning rate is too big, you won't converge. You, here, remark here, here the gradient is pointing, always, always toward here. But because my learning rate is too big, my gradient told me to be here, and I went. And then my gradient told to come back, and my gradient told me to come back here. So I'm always jumping from one side to the other, but I'm not reaching the minimum because my learning rate is too big. My learning rate is just draw me around the minimum. And here, okay, my learning rate is, 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 is getting me to the minimum, but at this slow, very slow pace, I have to have a lot of 
patience until I reach the minimum because the, the learning rate is too, too shy, it's too timid. So I, I'd like... Okay, okay. This is this is interesting. This is another. Th th this is interesting because, for example, if my learning rate was because this is where the stochastic procedure is always interest is, is is also interesting, because I have the stochastic procedure, I can escape the local minimum. I can escape the local minimums, but for that to happen, I have to be able to jump through this is small local minima, but again, if my learning rate is too small, I'll just be too shy. I won't be able to escape those local basins. Those local basins. So, the more, co the more complex uh, techniques will be ways, will be, will be techniques that attempt to find uh, ways to either set uh, the the learning rate automatically, to find the regimens for the learning rate, or to find ways to combine the previous, the previous gradients with, with the current gradients that make the technique less sensitive, less sensitive to the learning rate. So one of the favorites is this idea of, of the momentum. So you consider that when you, when you are going to a certain direction, if you, the gradient is pushing you to a certain direction, you consider that you have this kind of velocity. And if the next gradient tells you to go to a completely different direction, you don't follow it blindly. You say, OK, I'm going to change my, my direction, but uh, a little bit, because I, I was already going there. Now you are telling me to go there. So I'll move a little bit. So this is the idea of momentum. And then you have several complex, more complex, and, and, uh, and uh, let's say, statistically founded. When you do things like that, for example, take, uh, take not just the, the, the linear combination of the moment the, of, of, of the, the previous gradients, but take the square of the previous gradients. Uh, there, there are compelling reasons to do that, uh, statistical compelling reasons that you are exploiting the first and the second uncentered moments of, of the distribution of the gradients. So the, the math makes sense, but in the end, you can say that they are very simple procedures. The, 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 the finally, the code doesn't change very much, even if the if the math justification in the paper, this can be four pages, but in, in the code, it will be four lines. And the, this technique, which is called the ADAM, uh, that uses the two first moments of the, of the gradient, uh, in, the, in this idea of that you, you follow those two moments to decide what you do next, is one of the favorite techniques nowadays. Uh, okay. And there are other stuff. Uh, this MS prop uh, is, is, is a little bit more complicated. It's fairly used, but I won't go. I won't go uh, into detail here. I won't go into detail here. Yes. Yes. The case of uh, Adam. I have two memories, if you want. Yes, so here, MT, I'm saving. This is my current gradient. This is, the, this is the current value for the gradient. And this is the square of the current value for the gradient. On MT, I'm deciding how much, those, be those betas, I'm deciding how much do I save my previous linear moment and how much I will change for the current linear moment. And here, I'm doing the same thing for the square so moment. Where do you have to apply? I think that in the next, uh, the next, uh, here's the formula. 
So this is the change. This is the instantaneous change that you apply. So it's So, uh, as I said, it's, it's, I, I said that it was four lines, it's six lines. So, it's, I don't know, it's an eight-page paper, but in the code, uh, it's a six-line code. And this technique works fairly well. Then, afterwards, finding the exact values for, for those parameters uh, takes some time, take some time, some adjustment. Okay. More questions? Okay. Uh, the thing that I want to show you about those things is that they are not. Uh, it's not uh, inconsequential. The choice of picking up uh, the, the the bare bones. Uh, gradient descent or taking ADAM, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the, the, the symbol gradient descent tends to be stuck in, in those saddle points. And that's the main problem of, of training nowadays. Uh, there are very compelling papers showing that the biggest problem of uh, very deep networks, if you take very large networks, the local minima are not the main pro problem. The local minima tend to be fairly equivalent if the network is large. The main problem is that when you reach those saddle points, the optimization tends to get stuck in those points. And those points are very, very frequent. You have a lot of saddle points in your optimization space. So you have to have techniques that are able to escape those saddle points quickly. Because if you, if, you, if you get stuck on the, all those saddle points for, for a lot of time, you just be spending the, the, the electrical power in your lab <laughs> for nothing. You just be there a lot, a lot, and your, and your GPU is heating, <laughs> but you're not actually progressing. <coughs> okay. So, uh, that's all I, I want to talk about the optimization. So if you want, if you want to, to ask questions about backpropagation or the gradient descent, now it's a very good point to ask questions. Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I don't quite get. So you, you'd, like, you, you, you'd like to see more research about the optimization? The optimization adequate? If I consider that the state of the art, the current state of the art is adequate? Okay, so, okay. so if, if, if it's expensive, does it afford more research uh, to, to make it faster, and, and how do I see that? L let me get the next question, too, and, 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 and then I'll, I'll answer everything in context. Okay, so the, the thing is that, do I have nice uh, saddle points like that, or do I get those horrible, narrow uh, valleys, typical of high dimensionality? Do I have more questions? Third one, to answer all three in... Perspective. Okay, so let's answer those two. Uh, the thing is, uh, there is a lot of research on the optimization part. The people, people are working on the optimization part. People are working. So you see, we have uh, seven or eight uh, optimization algorithms. Those things come from somewhere. They, they don't, don't just appear. So yes, from one year to the another, the little deer optimization algorithm changes. And that happens because people are doing research in the area. Uh, 
So, yes. But one thing that I want to, that people put in perspective is that this procedure is very expensive. But it's cheapest than everything else. What we don't realize with deep learning is not how expensive it is, but how cheap it is. You do a stochastic gradient descent on ImageNet, and you are always complaining on how, ex how is slow it is, and how much GPU power it is, and, and et cetera, et cetera. But try to do SVM uh, on one million uh, 200,000 images and do the convex optimization of uh, SVM uh, on, 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 on such a large data set and then come back to talk to me how much does it cost. So, okay, yes, that's expensive, but in terms of what is feasible, uh, especially in terms of memory, especially in terms of memory, it's extremely cheap. It's very expensive, but it's, it's ex we're, we're trying to do very large scale stuff here. We are working with a million images, 100 million parameters, and it converges in about five days. That, that's fairly cheap. Nothing else is, is as cheap as that. So this is the first thing that I want to, to, to highlight. The second thing that I want to highlight is how general how general the thing is, as long as you can compute a derivative, kinda, because you don't even have to be uh, uh, differentiable everywhere. You can have some points where, you, or where the differential doesn't exist. As long as you can uh, compute the, the partial derivatives, it works. So it's extremely general. Uh, you can put uh, everything in the kitchen sink, uh, uh, the kitchen sink in your model, and then you just compute the right derivative uh, in, in, in the middle layer, and you do the multiplication, and it works. So this is extremely flexible, extremely flexible. Uh, so this is another advantage of the model. The geometry is horrible. <laughs> We're talking here about millions of parameters, so uh, don't be mistaken by those pretty pictures. Everything looks like those uh, thin uh, valleys of uh, high dimensional optimization, and that's why choosing the learning rate and the momentum is very complicated. Yes, getting the networks to converge depends on on learning from previous people. So the bottom line is that the models don't converge. The models don't converge. There is a reason why those things work today. They didn't uh, work in the 1980s. The models don't converge. There is a tiny, tiny amount of families of models that work among a huge universe of possible models uh, that, don't, that just don't work. And for the model to converge, you have to use the right initialization, uh, the right uh, randomization, the right uh, regularization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then, then the model converge. So making those things work is, is, not, is far from obvious uh, because because the, the derivative, the derivative is this huge, this long product. If the derivatives are always slightly uh, smaller than one, you have the problem of what's called, what is called uh, the vanishing gradient. So every scalar in, this, in, this, in those matrix are is slightly smaller than one, and in the end you have zero everywhere. And if those numbers are always slightly greater than one, in the end you have uh, infinite everywhere. So you have this problem of the vanishing or exploding gradients. So in order to make those things work, you have to pick up your functions very carefully to, not, uh, to let the gradient flow. The expression is, is, is that, let the gradient flow. You cannot make the gradients either explode or 
uh, vanish. And th this is very complicated. Uh, when, you when you are picking hyperparameters, so you are picking, for example, how many layers do you want to use, how, which, learning, which learning rate are you going to use, etc., etc., when you have to, to pick up this kind of hyperparameters, cross-validation is the classical way to do it. Nowadays, people are using and proposing things that are more powerful than just doing cross-validation. So if you do some Google search for Bayesian hyperparameter choice, and th there are libraries that are called, for example, hyperopt, hyperopt, that you can use those libraries to accelerate the hyperparameter choice. But hyperparameter selection, model selection, is still the most expensive part of the work. Uh, it, everything is sensitive to everything everywhere. So, <laughs> for example, uh, this input, it's very useful to, at very least, to erase the mean. At the very least. At very least, you take the mean, the, the average of the data, and you subtract that. Uh, often, you not only do that, but you, you, you whiten this, in, this, this input. At least you, take, you subtract the mean, and you divide by the the standard deviation component by component T to avoid this problem of biases that, that, uh, that make the things explode. Sometimes you do that layer by layer. There is something that's called batch normalization, that you do this layer by layer at each uh, batch. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not giving you all the details from, from what you need to do here. Uh, so yes, there is normalization and regularization everywhere, everywhere in the model. Let me advance just a little bit, and then I'll, I'll, I'll come back to... Yes? It's huge. It's huge. The, pro the, the activation function it will enter in the in derivatives. And, for example, if you use a hello, which is just zero on the negative part and uh, the identity on the positive part, this is a function that is very friendly, very friendly to the uh, long multiplications because the, each number will be either zero, either perfect one. So it is very robust to this problem of the exploding or vanishing gradients. Uh, if you do something different from Hello, you have to be careful to not move very far away from the, from the part of the, especially on in initialization, if you initialize poorly, uh, for example, if you initialize uh, away uh, from, the, from zero in the saturation zones, your gradients will be always very small, and you will never reach the quasi-linear zone of your sigmoid. So yes, Helu uh, helps a lot. OK, so I want to just talk a little bit about some uh, selected applications of this, this technique. The one I selected is a work that we're doing in our lab, which is medical application. We are doing automated melanoma screening. Uh, so th this is an interesting application for, for, for learning and for, uh, for classification because Melanoma, detect, melanoma diagnosis is really, really, really hard. Even for a dermatologist, uh, a dermatologist has to go through a special training to learn to differentiate melanoma from, from, from skin lesions, and it's easy to do why that is the case. Uh, melanoma and, and benign skin lesions are not that different from each other. So what we, we'd like to do here the, the, what the community is trying to do is to have techniques where we can, for example, do some kind of screening and uh, take away from, from, the, from the waiting line patients which are clearly healthy, for example. So you can uh, 
you can send to the dermatologist only the patients that have at least a little bit of risk. So th this would be very useful from a, from a healthcare perspective. Uh, the problem here, uh, and it's a problem common to all medical uh, cases, is that you don't have that much data. So medical data sets have to go through medical expertise. This is complicated. There are uh, confidentiality issues. Uh, you have to have to have access to the me to, to to medical personnel. So medical data sets usually when you have 2,000 images, you are happy. It's a big data set for medical applications, and 2,000 is nothing for for deep learning. So there is a procedure that is often used in this case, which is called transfer learning. In transfer learning, you take a model that already works for a given task, often, uh, most often, you take a data set that was pre-trained on ImageNet, you take some, some ImageNet model, and then you retrain this model on your target task. And the reason why this works is that the lower levels of the network tend to be fairly general. Do you remember when I showed you the, the lower the lower levels, and they tend to be uh, edges, they tend to be blobs, they tend to be textures. Those features tend to be fairly general, and the, the network specializes as you move towards the upper, the upper layers. So uh, there is a lot of knowledge here that can be recycled to, to, to new problems. So you can take the, this, this model pre-trained for ImageNet, and the retrain, retrain this model on your task, for example, melanoma detection. And there is an, a kind of simple, naive way to do it, in which you just take this model as, if you want, a feature extraction uh, model, and you take, for example, the, the lower layers, and you take the output of the next to next layer, and you train something, for your task, for example, another fully connected layer or an, even an SVM for your task. And you can do a little better than that. You can take the entire model, uh, change just the last layer, because before you had a thousand uh, classes on the output, and now you want just two classes on the output. And then you retrain you retrain the entire model uh, just using backpropagation. Just using backpropagation. Uh, so th those are what we call transfer learning. And the, so, so th th this is really the idea. You have some, some task that you want to do, uh, melanoma screening here, and you can use uh, other data sets, uh, related or unrelated. So I said that ImageNet is fairly common. Uh, and you can use to, 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 to train your task. I won't have time to go into detail here, unfortunately, but if you want to see the, pro the procedure in perspective, uh, this is uh, a paper that we published in the Symposium of Biomedical Images this year, so this, this April, that describes different ways of doing this, this transfer learning procedure. Uh, the preprint is open on archive, and, and here's the the publisher's version. Uh, uh, melanoma screening is something that we are doing a lot uh, lately, and uh, we, 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 ha we got quite nice results in recently. This, is also, this was also this year, this February, we, we got uh, on top of an international competition on, on, on melanoma using deep learning. Uh, this is something that you can also study if you want, if you want to see a, 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 a complex and uh, in an application, in a context, if you want to see how a deep learning uh, using several models, using stacked models, uh, in the context of an application, you can play with the code, you can play with the code of, the, of our participation in the competition, uh, it's open. Uh, another topic that I'd like to quickly mention 
uh, is the topic of uh, adversarial attacks on, on deep learning models. This is something that is fairly interesting. Let me just open the presentation here. So this is something that has, that has received a lot of attention in the last years, is that uh, those networks, the deep networks, they are subjected to what we call adversarial attacks, in which you can, if you have the model, if you know the model, you can optimize the input to mislead the network. So here we have uh, five, of five images that the network classifies correctly. So for example, in this, this image, the right uh, label is fox, and the network says it's a fox. And then we add uh, a small amount of noise, but this is not uh, a random noise. This is a noise that was optimized to mislead the network. Still, you see that it's almost, almost imper uh, uh, imperceptible. The, 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 f to my eyes, this image here is identical to this one. And then uh, the network says, okay, this is not a fox anymore. This is a mushroom. This is a mushroom. And uh, this is something that is very interesting. This caused some polemic in the, in the community. Some people telling, okay, the, the adversarial attacks are a deep flaw in the deep networks that shows that the deep networks are really unreliable. And the other people showing, the, okay, it's not, that, it's not like that, especially because other models that are not deep learning models, things like SVM, for example, also are uh, sensitive to, to adversarial attacks. But th this, this thing is interesting for me, the, 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 the sensitivity to adversarial attacks uh, is interesting, not on, on, on the practical aspect of it, but on the, the things that it, uh, it says, that what it tells us about the, the functioning of the networks, uh, how it gives us uh, insights on how the networks may work or may not work. Uh, I, I won't have time to go through the details, but uh, uh, what we're doing here to create the adversarial images is to minimize a distortion, to take the least possible distortion, uh, subjected to a constraint. And the constraint is that you have to find a distortion that misleads the network, that makes the network uh, fall into a mistake. Uh, so I won't have time to, to explore this in detail. Uh, in, in, my, in my research, we also exploited the adversarial attacks to autoencoders. So autoencoders is a very interesting kind of network. It's not a network for classification. It's a network for reconstruction. So in an autoencoder, the output is supposed to be equal to the input. So you, you go through... A, a bottleneck in the, in the middle, so you find a compact representation, a small sized representation, and then you try to rebuild the input from the output. And we have worked on attempting to find adversarial attacks also to this, those autoencoder things. Are we talking about autoencoders, Matt, on the... On the okay, so I won't have time to, to go through the details here, but if you want to take a look on this, there are also here the papers. Uh, I think that all the, paper, the, all the two papers have the code, all have the source code. So both papers, uh, adversary images for classifiers and adversary images for, for autoencoders, both papers have the, the code uh, available if you, want to play, if you want to play a bit with... with uh, with the concept. Uh, so, okay, that's it. Let me come back to... Okay, and then I have five minutes <laughs> to, to talk a little bit about 
some ethical concerns that are brought by, by this network. And the, for the ethical concerns, I want to talk about uh, quickly about three aspects. One is about uh, uh, job stealers. Uh, the other is fate sealers. And finally, about people killers. Uh, so, the most immediate danger that I think uh, about, the, the, uh, about this new wave of automatization, this new wave of uh, artificial intelligence, is the problem of uh, uh, job stealers. The problem that we're now uh, having machines that can do what people can do. This is, of course, nothing new. We're, the Industrial Revolution was the 18th century. Uh, so. But I think that what's emblematic now is that we are used, we are used as a mankind to having manual labor automatized. This is something that is not an old concept. But now we are having intellectual work automatized. The alarm sounded for me in 2011. So this is not even the new deep learning revolution. This is the old uh, uh, information retrieval, uh, classical models, bag of words revolution, when uh, you had armies of lawyers that were just substituted by uh, information retrieval algorithms. In the United States, because it's a common law system, it's not a civil law system, uh, finding similar cases to, to research on the jurisprudence is very important to defend your case. And usually, this work was made by junior member of the, of the offices that just went to the libraries and the computers and tried to find similar cases. And suddenly, those junior uh, lawyers found themselves without jobs, because now this kind of job was automatized. Uh, one thing that I find important to see uh, is how uh, the revenues, the revenues concentration uh, that started fairly concentrated in the beginning of the, 20, of the 20th century. And then we had this, this kind of minimum around the 50s and the 60s in the post-war. Now we have a concentration of the revenue that is as large uh, or worse than we had in the beginning of the 20th century. It's like uh, uh, the revenue distribution of the 50s and 60s have never existed. And what's interesting to see in this graph is how uh, economic productivity and gains in economic productivity is sti are still going strong. They are still going very strong. But median income, okay, the, the, the income of middle class, has stagnated. And that since, since the 80s, since the 80s, the median income has stagnated. And uh, in a way, uh, the new industrial revolution and now the new uh, artificial intelligence revolution are responsible for that. So this is something that we have to, we have to talk about that and we have to decide what to do about that. Uh, the, the, the division now in... in, in jobs that are growing, jobs that are stagnating, is no longer manual versus cognitive jobs. It's more routine versus non-routine jobs. So routine jobs, even intellectual ones, like, for example, accountancy or, or register keeping, bookkeeping, etc., are stagnated. And manual, non-routine jobs, like, for example, gardening or or caring for, for elderly are still going strong. So uh, it's, it's interesting to see that although there is some correlation, there is some correlation between uh, how well paid the job is and how easy it's to automatize the job, this correlation is far from perfect. You have uh, this middle scale uh, part where you have fairly well-paid jobs that can be uh, in, in, that have a, a lar in large part can be automatized. 
So th th this is something that we, ha that we have to, to decide what to do about that. Otherwise, uh, what will happen is that a large portion of, the, of people w won't have uh, revenues. They won't have jobs and they won't have revenues. Another thing that, uh, that I want to, 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 to talk about is the problem of the biases of artificial intelligence. <laughs> I look, at, look around you, look around you at, in, this, in this audience and see who is watching. It's mostly white guys. <laughs> uh, we have a problem of diversity in this, in, in this field of artificial intelligence. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to see that we have, uh, that we have uh, uh, girls and people of color in this audience because often there is not a single girl and there is not a single people of, person of color in the, in, in the audience. And uh, we, we have to work to make the field more diverse because uh, otherwise uh, uh, the, the, the techniques, the, the models tend to reflect uh, the biases of the data. There are some very interesting cases, for example, how uh, Amazon decided to, where, in which regions of the town uh, it would put its uh, same-day delivery service. This was decided by a machine learning model, and they found that the model was extremely biased against uh, neighborhoods that were mostly uh, black neighborhoods. Even densely populated regions in which same-day delivery makes a lot of sense. And the interesting thing is that the model doesn't have direct access to this information. The model doesn't know whether or not the people that live in the neighborhood uh, are black or white. The thing is that this kind of bias uh, emerged because of how the decisions were made. And when you don't have uh, uh, women or people of color in your group, uh, you don't have people that can tell you the obvious. Because uh, f f for, for us white guys, those things are often invisible. We don't realize this kind of, of, of bias. So, so this, 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 those things are particularly important uh, as we have uh, models that mainly decide our life. They decide which ads are we are going to, do, to see. And there is an interesting case about Google AdSense. They found out that uh, high-paying jobs uh, were, uh, were shown as ads to men much more often than to women. So, for example, if I put, uh, I want to seek about backpropagation properties on Google, it would show to me, are you looking for backpropagation properties? Don't you want uh, this job, this high-paying job uh, uh, on this company? But if Roselie would put the same query, it would show to her, Roselie, do you know that, that the Sephora company has, shown, has the new Minerals <laughs> cosmetics collection? So that, that there was this huge uh, slant, there was this huge bias uh, that has consequences. That has consequences because then uh, th this, th th there is this population that don't have access to an opportunity and uh, is not even aware, it's not even aware that it's missing this opportunity. And uh, as those models decide uh, our credit scores, where, in which parts of town we are going to visit, and even who we date, <laughs> even who we date, uh, being aware and being careful about those biases is, is very important. Uh, so th those are the fate sealers. This is the fate sealers part. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about the people killers. When you talk about the people killers and the menaces of artificial intelligence, I, we always think about that. But I think this is a straw man. I think this is a straw man. There are some colleagues of mine that say that artificial intelligence is the biggest existential menace to mankind in the 20th first century. And I love that phrase because I found it of an optimist. I found it saying that the, the, the artificial intelligence is the biggest menace to mankind in the 20th first century. I found that that, that that reveals such a big optimism that I can only characterize as cute. 
Because in a mankind that has the nuclear arsenal and climate change, putting artificial intelligence on the top, that person is very, very optimistic. So I think that this is a straw man. Uh, we are very far away from, from Skynet. We have seen what those models are. They are powerful, but they are very far away from the complexities of the brain. As I said, they are glorified multi-layer multi linear models with selected non-linearities. We, we are not more close to Skynet today than we were in 2005. But we have people killers. And they just don't look like uh, uh, Schwarzenegger. Th th those are the people killers. Th those things are happening right now. Right now. So if you want to worry about uh, uh, people killing, uh, if we want to worry about people killing artificial intelligence, let's worry about that. Because we have drones, we have military drones that throw bombs at people. And of course, they are not completely autonomous. There is human decision involved, but often, often, the final decision is autonomous. The, the final decision uh, of the pattern recognition, uh, where the, the, the drone draws the bomb or not, is autonomous. And the, the thing that's interesting, <laughs> or tragic, is that those, uh, those drones make mistakes. They make mistakes. And the, there is this work that I, I, I really uh, suggest that everyone takes a look at this work. It's called Blue Sky Days. It's from, uh, I think, a Dutch uh, photographer uh, that, that makes a very interesting uh, work. He, he took a civilian, uh, just a civilian, not a quadricopter or a civilian drone, and he took pictures of people in the United States doing this kind of inversion, taking pictures of people in situations where the military drones often do mistakes because they are concentration of people in situations that there are a lot of shadows and things like that uh, where often mistakes were made because, for example, th those are just people doing sports but sometimes the, the drone decides that those are, this um, is a military, uh, it's a military group. Uh, and the, the project is called... Uh, uh, I promise that I won't cry this time. The last time I cried, I won't cry this time. <laughs> the, the project is called uh, Blue Sky Days because uh, of, of this, this story. This, um, this boy that was reporting about the death of his, his grandmother that was just, uh, just in picking up vegetables in her garden, and the boy was saying, okay, I'm, I'm crying now. <laughs> the boy just said, I no longer love blue skies. I actually prefer gray skies uh, because the drones don't, uh, don't fly on, on when the skies are gray. Yeah. So we have to think about those stuff. Uh, I don't know. We have to review the Geneva Conventions to, 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 to preview, the, because this is dangerous. This is very dangerous. Are we going to have a new arms, like we have an arms race for the, for, the, for the nuclear weapons? Are we going to have now an arms race about military artificial intelligence weapons? Uh, this is something that we have to, to, to worry about. This is what we actually have to worry about, not about uh, some Skynet uh, nonsense. Okay, so to finish in a more posi positive note, uh, I have to tell you that uh, Big companies are working on that, so this is a good uh, news. Uh, when you take, again, the, the big five here, Amazon, IBM, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, uh, they are creating initiatives to, to, to promote good usage of artificial intelligence. Uh, there is this, this NGO right now, it's called the Partnership on AI, if you, if you Google that, you'll find this page, that's trying to create guidelines for how AI should be promoted to extend the maximum benefit to, to everyone. Uh, from a more academic point of view, there is this very interesting report 
on artificial intelligence uh, by Stanford. So th this is a very interesting document. And I think that this, those are steps in the right direction. Uh, and I think that all of us who are researchers or pra practitioners in the area should be aware of those initiatives. But I think that we have to be careful about the, those initiatives. For example, especially this document <laughs> uh, and, and the, the, the partnerships of the industry. Often I have the feeling that they, are, they have this kind of discourse. Okay, you don't have to do any legal regulations because we are doing the regulations ourselves. And this document ends with the, the following phrase. Uh, we don't suggest that any legal regulations are made because uh, the industry is able to do its own regulations. And the proof that this is true is that just to look at privacy, industry made it such a good job at out self-regulating privacy. <laughs> and this is said without any irony. <laughs> This is said without any irony. So when the document finishes with that phrase, it lost a lot of my respect. <laughs> Sorry, Stanford, but you just lost my respect. So the, the sensation that I have nowadays, I love this painting. This is one of my favorite paintings. It's the Garden of Earthly Delight by Bosch. I have the sensation that with, this, with artificial intelligence, we are living this kind of frenzy. We are in this, this kind of frenzy of uh, nowadays in the field. Uh, whether this frenzy will lead us to the hell or to the paradise is something that we have to carefully work on. And so here I finish my, my, my talk, and I thank you very much for being here with me.